morning. The time is now eight or nine thirty-nine. And a quorum of the board is present. The State Board of Education meeting of March eighth, twenty sixteen is called to order. First item on the agenda is approval of the agenda in order of priority. Are there any items to add or delete from the agenda? Seeing none, the chair will entertain a motion. So move. It's been moved and supported. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Nay. Motion carries. Introduction of State Board of Education members and guests. Marilyn, at this time, please introduce the State Board members. Good morning. And ask the audience to introduce themselves. All right. Good morning. As we go around the table, beginning at my left, the State Superintendent, Brian Whiston, serves as chairman of the board. And to his left, John Austin, president of the board from Ann Arbor. Cassandra Albrich, standing. She is the board's vice president. She's from Rochester Hills. She's busy. She's on the move. And um, Michelle Fecto is the board's secretary, and she's from Detroit. Richard Ziley, board member from Dearborn. And then the Michigan Teacher of the Year is Rick Joseph. He's from Birmingham Covington School, and he's with fifth and sixth graders when he's not at the board table with us or traveling throughout the state. Across the table is the governor's education advisor, Karen McPhee. Board member Eileen Weiser from Ann Arbor, Kathleen Strauss, board member from Detroit, Lupe Ramos Montini, board member from Grand Rapids. She's the National Association of State Boards of Education delegate with the board. And next to me is Pamela Pugh. She's from Saginaw. She's the board's treasurer. And I'm Marilyn Schneider. I'm the state board executive. And as the state superintendent said, we'd like guests and audience members to introduce themselves so if you'd be so kind as to do that. Do you want to start, Al San? Sure. Al San Henry. Superintendent's office. Yeah, where is Deputy Superintendent of Educational Services. Madeline Albright. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so you voted for Helen. Superintendent for Administrative and School Support Services. Good morning, Wendy Larkin from the Office of Public and Governmental Affairs. Hi, Fran Mason, here to have Michigan Special Education Advisory Committee. I serve as their facilitator. Chris Flavor with Dongwer News Service. Yes, Liz. Liz Bauer, Cardale, Michigan. Oh, Liz. Executive Director of Learning Board, Michigan. Good morning, everyone. Child President of Learning Board, Michigan. Reed Ellison, Frank. Director of the Office of Education, School and Innovation. Shalana Maxine, Director of the Education Department. Renee Demar-Johnson, Director of the Office of Early Childhood Development and Family Education. Good morning, Gary Jensen, ACT in Michigan. Terry Owens, Educational Testing Service, Federal Division. Judy Pritchett, Macomb Intermediate School District. Good morning, Paul Salau, Wayne Risa. Hi, good morning, Paul Gadsden. I'm from Renaissance Learning. <clears throat> Marl Moss, uh, Director of the Office of School Support Services. And I'm Marty Ackley. I'm the Director of the Office of Public and Governmental Affairs here in the department. Certainly welcome everyone here today, particularly the two students. Uh, what was the first student's name? I'm sorry. Reed Ellison Frank. Thank you for being here. And the other is Johnny Bowers, who is Linda Forward's grandson. So thank the two students for being here. All right. With that, uh, discussion items. The first item on today's committee of the whole agenda is a presentation on early on. This presentation will provide an overview of Michigan's approach to providing individualized services and support for families of infants and toddlers with disabilities or delays as required under Part C of the Individuals with Disability Act, or IDEA, and known in Michigan as Early On. We have uh, Susan Broman, Deputy Superintendent, Renee Demars johnson Director of Early Childhood Development, Family Education, and Vanessa Weinborn, Coordinator of Early Childhood Development and Family Education, to provide us an update on this important Early On topic. Thank you, Superintendent Whiston. It's a pleasure to be able to update the board on early on. What we're going to do today is give you what I call a primer on early on, 
or early on 101, and then we're going to talk about what the Auditor General has said about the implementation of early on in Michigan, and then connect this to the work that is going on in Flint regarding early on. So I'll turn it over to the experts. Okay. So um, you need to know that early on is the name that Michigan has given the Part C of Individuals with Disabilities Education Act in Michigan. <coughs> Part C serves children from birth up until the time in which they turn three. And then Part B of IDEA takes over to serve students with disabilities from age three up to until they're 21. Early on um, also has been around <coughs> for a very long time in the reauthorization of um, the act that supports students with disabilities in 1993, it became part Part C, prior to that it was Part H. And then also you need to know that in Michigan we've been supporting children and students with disabilities since 1971 with a Michigan mandatory special education law. Just yesterday the Education Commission of the States came out with a um, document entitled Constitutional Obligations for Public Education we are one of nine states that require attention to the public education of students with disabilities. So I think that that tells something about the importance that we place on serving uh, children and youth with disabilities. This um, next slide tells you about what the law says with regard to what the purpose of the Part C um, statute requires. We're really focusing on the enhancement of infants and toddlers with disabilities so that we can minimize the, and reduce costs to society. We're really focused on the importance of brain development in those first three years of life and if we can indeed mitigate some of the developmental concerns during those first three uh, years we definitely will have an ability to maximize those children's potential. Um, and uh, be able for those children to live independently in society. We do that through capacity building within families. Certainly with infants and toddlers, we're not going to snatch babies and toddlers out of their parents' arms in order to assist in their development, but rather we make sure that we're helping families understand those developmental needs and um, provide for those services. And finally, the law requires us to <coughs> attend to all children, particularly minority, low income, inner city and rural children, and infants and toddlers in foster care. Early on is not a program, but rather it's a system of services that are mandated under Part C of IDEA. The focus is working with families to identify resources that will promote their child's developmental needs and that requires <coughs> collaboration at the local level so that children are identified and provided services at the earliest possible time in their development. Here's one way of looking at the structure of early on, it not being a program. We have to think about in, it in other ways. Um, the U.S. Department of Education's <coughs> Office of Special Education Program has been designated by Congress and the IDEA law to um, implement the IDEA law. And within Michigan, we are the designated, governor designated entity that will provide that um, implementation. In other states that even though it's the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, that responsibility sometimes falls to other agencies within state government such as the health department or the social services entity within a state. Each state agency um, and here at, in the Michigan Department of Education within the Office of Great Start, each state agency has a coordinator, a Part C coordinator of services, and that is our, my colleague here, Vanessa Winborn. And off to the right in the, in the diagram, you'll see the Michigan Interagency Coordinating Council. The law requires us to not just operate in a silo, but rather, indeed, attend to the importance of this cross-agency uh, support 
our members of the MICC are appointed by the governor and there are specific things within the law um, that uh, he follows, his appointment office follows in selecting individuals to be on our MICC. Also connected to the, to the Office of Great Start, on the right hand side you'll see some statewide initiatives because again, this is a comprehensive program. We can't do it alone with our staff here at the Department of Education. So we have some major grantees that we will discuss later. But in addition, off to the left, you'll see that uh, we have very important liaisons with the Department of now Health and Human Services, working closely with our public health folks, our mental health folks, and our child welfare folks that are in MDHHS. At the state level, we can't really make anything happen without the local service areas making sure that they are implementing well. Because we are an education lead, we have selected our intermediate school districts as those who will implement at the local level. So all 56 school district, intermediate school districts receive Part C funding and they each have an early on coordinator. And next, just to give you a quick overview of the program, our services are, and we pride ourselves in that, are strength-based, family-centered, and we developed strong relationships between the professionals and the parents or guardians of the children that we're serving. Uh, there's a lot of interagency collaboration as well, because without that, as Renee mentioned, we wouldn't be able to do this work. Um, our eligibility is considered to be very broad. Um, we have eligibility criteria whereby an infant or a toddler with an established condition, which is either a physical or mental condition that can lead to a developmental delay, uh, who's eligible, or if there's a 20% developmental delay or one standard deviation below the mean. But for those children who are two months years, I mean two months of age, it's any kind of delay. You don't really want to lose the children, and our, our motto really is to try to get to children as early as possible. Now, I mentioned the established condition. We have 11 categories here that uh, children who are experiencing some kind of condition would become eligible automatically with documentation for early on. And if you look down that list, about the fourth up from the bottom, we have exposures affecting fetus or the child pre and postnatal. And that's where the current issue in Flint sort of fits in with lead. Uh, we updated this list. The timing was just unreal, to be quite honest with you. Uh, we had gotten information from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention that the uh, uh, threshold or the reference number for lead poisoning be lowered from 10 micrograms per deciliter to 5. And so we were in the process of doing that when Flint hit the headlines. So we didn't do it because of that, but we did it because the Center for Disease Control and Prevention recommended that we do that. Okay. Um, also, with developmental delay, it's in either of these <coughs> developmental domains that if a child is experiencing some challenges, that would qualify them. So we look at the child holistically in all of these different areas. And this is a list of our services that we provide. Uh, it's quite a list, and if you look closely, you can see that most of those services would require an individual with an advanced degree. So it's not an inexpensive uh, support, but it's uh, very expertise that we need to address and help children who are having these challenges to get on the right path and move forward in their growth and development. Our process is that uh, we accept referrals and we have a contractor who works with us and does that for us. Referrals also go into some of the intermediate school districts and anyone can make a referral. There isn't a specific requirement who can do that. Your neighbor who has concern about a child can call us and then we would contact the family and start working with them if they so choose. Early on is voluntary, it's not mandatory, so it's up to the family to decide if they want to participate 
or not. So we contact them, gather information about that child and his or her family so that we know how best to develop and which services would best fit that family and child's needs. Uh, there's a multidisciplinary evaluation that's required by law and um, we do that with uh, the professionals who work with us and using all of that information we eventually get to the individualized family service plan which is a cornerstone of Part C that we have that individualized family service plan or an IFSP so that the family and the professionals are all on the same page know where we're headed <laughs> and agree to the, the plan of support. Our I, uh, process includes, like I said, we have an IFSP meeting. We are also required to do uh, a six-month review for all children who have IFSPs and each year uh, new IFSP can be developed or evaluated to see if there are changes that need to occur. So those are some of the requirements uh, in the federal regulation that we do. As a child approaches uh, their third birthday, there's a transition that's required. So, but if the child and family meets their outcomes before three, then they can exit early on. But if not, when that child approaches that third birthday, um, there are steps that we have to take to make sure that the transition from early on into Part B 619 or what's known as preschool special ed occurs or other uh, services in the community if they don't qualify for special ed. So we do that for every child that's there around that third birthday. Renee mentioned that we're one of a few states who looked at and provided support to uh, young children and their uh, families with special ed support before the federal government. And so what we have is uh, more or less a bifurcated eligibility. So within early on, you have children who qualify using the eligibility uh, definition that I shared with you earlier. But there are some children whose challenges are more involved and, more, and need more intense services. And those children may qualify for Michigan mandatory special education within the state. Uh, and so there's a small segment, roughly third or 40% of the children who also qualify for early on um, that meet the definition for a special ed. So all children under three who meet the definition for Michigan Mandatory Special Ed automatically are qualified for early on. But we do have children who do not meet that threshold for special ed and we refer to them as early on only and you'll see more reference to that later. So you just heard about how important it is to have those individual opportunities with families to support their young children's development. And this slide tells you something about the limited amount of funding that is forwarded to Michigan from the, from the federal government to do this work. This is federal fiscal year 14 funding. Um, and actually, I looked back to about 2009, and it hovers right around that 11 to $12 million mark. We split that award into two parts. We retain some at the state level to make sure that we're meeting our federally mandated supports to the entire system. And then we ship the rest of the money out, the majority of the money out, to our local intermediate school districts to use as the core amount of funding for that coordination of the services that exist in their local area. That funding um, transfer, the allocation out to the local ISDs, is based on a formula that you as a state board had approved for us, and it takes into account, one of the things it takes into account certainly, is the population of children birth to three in a service area. And so you see that in some very small service areas, um, an amount that they receive is about $48,000 to do all of that stuff that we talked about, and whereas our largest service area gets about $1.4 million in that federal fiscal year 2014 funding. We looked at the 56 budgets that they um, provided to us as they budget their funds. 
predominantly those funds that they receive are going to be used for the local administration. Remember we said you got to have a local early on coordinator designated. And then they take into consideration the other um, resources that are already available in their communities and try to budget for the things that there may be some gaps. We see family training, counseling, and home visiting as one of the primary ways in which we um, address the developmental needs of children through their families along with the service coordination that needs to occur so that families know where to access resources. In addition, instructional services and social work typically are not easily um, uh, funded with other sources, so those are things that they budget um, within their budgets. This then gives you a sense of who, how many kids we're serving in a year. We do two kinds of counts. We do a point in time count, which is kind of like a count day. And in federal fiscal year 14, our count day showed that we had about 8,900 children enrolled on a certain day. But we also do a period count. Over a 12 month period, we had 18,376 children that we served. Because kids can be born and immediately receive services they can um, meet the, the, uh, the ex ex expectations within their IFSP and um, move out of early on, or they may uh, turn three and then move on into other kinds of either community or special education supports. If, uh, and as and Vanessa mentioned, about 40% of our children are also eligible for Michigan special education support. But if you go back and think about the way in which um, we had about uh, $9 million, and you're thinking about those 18,000 children that are receiving services, you're looking at less than $1,000 per child to provide a full year's worth of service. And we know that an evaluation, an assessment, costs about $200. So then you get about $314 to um, do the rest of the services that are needed. In addition, we wanted to highlight some of the ways in which we, from the state level, we support our early on field. We um, have a comprehensive public awareness campaign that is managed through our contractor, and they do child find. We have easy ways for families to learn about the development of their children and then um, either self-refer or connect with pediatricians or other health providers to make a decision about whether or not they want to go through an assessment and evaluation. And we have a comprehensive system of personnel development that really attends to our providers' leadership skills and we strengthen their qualifications and increase their expertise in working with these, their, these families and their children with disabilities. We also have um, uh, an expectation that we have accurate data to report to the federal government. So we do have a uh, information project that we fund through Wayne State University. We seed a little bit of money to our inter-tribal inter council to make sure that our tribes that are um, residing in Michigan have the ability to identify and serve our very youngest children with disabilities. Again, we partner with MDHHS, so we seed a little bit of money over there so that they have the staff capacity to connect to policies and procedures that are um, uh, being promulgated out of their agency. And we maintain some funds so that we have full partnership with parents. Parents often uh, need, are asked to sit at tables as full partners and they need the financial support in order to do that. So we make sure that we have that available. We cannot do this on that small amount of money that we maintain at the state level um, without the support of Part B, the, the big part of IDEA. And so we um, have identified ways in which the systems and supports that they do at the state level can also serve the needs of Part C. This list provides you with the kinds of things that are pretty obvious for us that we kind of <laughs> go, whew, so glad that they're already doing that. All we have to do now is make sure that our parents know that they have the ability to make the complaints, be in dispute resolution, have mediation support and due process hearings, as well as um, the 
continuous improvement monitoring system, which is an electronic system whereby we can identify um, ways in which a local uh, system would uh, need to improve and we can um, get out there and help them. In November of 2013, the Office of the Auditor General uh, published a report about the implementation of early on within the state of Michigan. And there were two material findings and five reportable findings. Uh, the material findings really dealt with the idea that those early on only children did not have that long list of services that you saw earlier, early intervention services, did not have access to those services. Uh, as I mentioned, those services were provided, are to be provided by highly qualified and um, specialists really in particular areas. The other thing was that MDE, uh, the Auditor General said MDE did not ensure that ISDs develop and reviewed IFSPs for <coughs> children and their families who qualified for early on services. So on the other ones, the other five, about summer services, we um, have been working with intermediate school districts about summer services. We've actually gotten some to change their contract with their employees so that they can provide year-round services, being a school system. That's been a challenge for a while. The other thing that's different for us than, say, your typical education uh, service or a provision of service is that our children have to be served in the natural environment, an environment where you find children their age. They're typically developing peers. So primarily that happens a lot in the home or in uh, child care facilities or other places that you would find kids, library hour, Jim Bree, those kind of things. And so we have to travel out to where those children are actually participating in their community and support that child and family in that community. But that's a different cost and a different service uh, delivery system than education may be accustomed to. Uh, and that we timely provide the early intervention services and then there's the requirement that we do public awareness and child find and help those children meet those child outcomes. So the recommendation from the Office of the Auditor General was that we implement measures to <coughs> ensure that ISD <coughs> comply with the federal requirements for Part C. <coughs> what we've done so far to uh, address these concerns is that we've increased the number of desk audits for local service areas. We have updated and redistributed the personnel standards for uh, individuals working within the early intervention system. We are currently exploring a process to provide better guidance to the uh, early intervention field <laughs> around the Michigan administrative, administrative rules for special ed so that they are better able to take the uh, requirements in MARS and apply those to infants and toddlers. We've gotten feedback from the field that the requirements that are there in MARS, which were written primarily for school-aged children, are very difficult and they had a hard time trying <clears throat> to figure out how do they apply that for an infant and a toddler. So right now we are developing information and guidance for the field. The other piece that is the most challenging, the other things we've been able to address, but it's obtain additional funds to support early on. So that's really the, the main thrust, I think, in terms of helping us to um, meet the challenges identified by the Office of the Auditor General. Um, so. yeah. And I would say that in a 2014 report that the the National Association that's called the Infant Toddler Coordinating Youth <coughs> Association, which is the association that Vanessa belongs to, uh, they did a, a survey of all, of all of the states, 47 of whom replied, and 44 of those indicated that they have state funds that support Part C. We are not one of those states that have state funds to support this um, really important effort. So this uh, last slide is about the uh, Flint Supplemental. As you are probably <coughs> aware, 
uh, the state legislature and the governor signed a uh, bill providing additional funds for residents in the city of Flint and to provide two million ten thousand for early on or those kids birth to three as Renee mentioned early in her presentation research <laughs> finding more and more about those first three years of life and the importance of serving children and intervening early as possible it's the time frame when that child's brain is still developing it's very um, pliable and um, needs to you know receive the support and nurturing to put that child on the right developmental trajectory uh, for the future and really after three or four years of age it becomes remedial but this is when you can still make a difference in a child's life so um, luckily and I, I think wisely the administration did provide funding for birth to three to do the uh, monitoring of these children so that we can identify any symptoms of lead exposure as early as possible and intervene. Also to pay for service coordinators to add psychologists and then to do some community training and wraparound services for those children. Those children deserve our, our loving arms around them and, their, and our support. So that's what we would love to do and plan to do as a result of this I think so we wanted to make sure that you had more detailed information about contacting me or Vanessa and with Susan here at the table we'll entertain questions any questions go ahead Eileen and then Kathleen then Lupe um, when you talk about the fact that we're one of three states that doesn't support Part C uh, I was curious about how underfunded it is for the state, what the demand has been that's been on that, and is it mainly uh, money not going to ISDs? Is it administrative uh, funds for the department? How how has the uh, yes? <laughs> Leave it there. Mm -hmm. Well, Renee gave you a figure that when you take the funding that we get from the federal government and divide it up by the number of children and their families that we serve, eighteen thousand plus children. It comes out somewhere around $500 a year. If we did, we, if we didn't even do the mandated activities at the state level, that's just taking the total award. Um, what we figured it would cost <coughs> on an annual basis, based on national research, that it's somewhere around $8,300 that that child would need a year. How much? 8,300. 8,300. If you look at it uh, in terms of once a week, a visit for early intervention provided by one of those or more than one of those uh, specialists that we mentioned in the presentation. Thanks. Kathleen, Charles? Well, first of all, thank you. First of all, I want to thank you for this presentation. It's been a long time since we've yes. had an explanation of early on, and, and it should be very valuable. We've known for years now about the birth to three as being such a critical time in brain development mm -hmm. and we should be supporting this and this is to hear that we're one of three states that doesn't put money into this that's really revelation mm -hmm. I, I didn't know that I didn't realize that mm -hmm. so that's something else we have to be really concerned about trying to help get that done mm -hmm. everything we talk about <laughs> It sees we need more revenue to uh, really do the job that we're supposed mm -hmm. to do. People expect us to do it, but they yes. so far haven't been willing to pay for it. Mm -hmm. So that's really unfortunate. But thank you very much for the presentation and this information. It's really, I think, a very important program. And uh, as I say, we've known it for a long time, so we really have to pay more attention to the early on, the first three years. Can I respond to you a bit? And looking at states that have done research where there is what I would call very robust support of the services that are needed, if you look at what happens with children, 42% do not end up needing special ed when they go into kindergarten. And so, as my mother would say, 
penny wise, pound foolish. We've, you'd think we would have learned that lesson, a little, but what is it in Michigan? What, the, what percentage of early on children do go into uh, special ed? Well, well um, as we mentioned, we have about a third or 40 percent of the children who are, who are eligible for Michigan Mandatory Special Ed and, and about that percentage end up moving forward into Part B. That's compared to the other states? Well, the other states are, the research I'm talking about is when children actually enter kindergarten. Oh. And that's a, that's a different that's than. Different that's than what different than what I'm Yeah. Well, do we have that figure for Michigan? No, not right now, but we can oh. look into it. We haven't asked for that report from SEPI, so oh. <laughs> we can definitely ask for that. That would be interesting to see mm -hmm. that, because that would be a selling point, that's true. it seems to me. Yes. All right, we had Lupe, and then we had Rick, and then Pam, and then Eileen. Oh, oh, sorry, Michelle. I might as well jump in. Too. All right, we'll just go around the table. <laughs> okay, well, I, I truly appreciate uh, this report because I, I truly am advocate of cultivating the brain early on and having a, a grandchild, she's six years old now, and she's you know, we started early on. She started school when she was three and all those kind of things. So I know the brain is ready mm -hmm. for development. Now, my question is, how many, how many people of uh, bilingual backgrounds, whether it be Spanish or another, back, another language, mm -hmm. have taken advantage of this program? And when they do, uh, how are their needs met? If there's a language barrier, mm -hmm. what what do you do? The exact figure I will need to get back to you, but they do participate, and we do keep track of that. We do have our materials in Spanish as well as uh, as well as Arabic, um, so we we do have that information available, and, and an interpreter is used when they uh, present themselves too early on, so that that interpreter can interpret the information that's shared back and forth between the program and the family. So you hire a, from a consultant the interpreting service. The local programs have. Uh, oh, they have mm -hmm. internally. Yes. That, mm -hmm. Okay. I, I would be very interested to see because, and, and I think I have the permission of, of uh, putting this in my Facebook page, my um, state board uh, Facebook page, your phone number and all the okay. information. So, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna put it in Spanish, great, uh, in English, so people know that this uh, department does exist mm -hmm. and they can take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Rick Joseph and Pam. Um, we I are just working wanna, a while. I just want to echo um, everyone's congratulations and thanks. I know, first of all, thank you for supporting the, the children of Flint. They certainly do mm -hmm. um, deserve our loving arms around them, without question. I also again echo what Kathleen said is that there's research also that shows that investment in early childhood education is arguably more important than investment in secondary or, or in college education and that their trajectory for so many kids is set. <coughs> um, also there's as you probably know better than I there's research that shows the incarceration rates for kids that are that um, are in some somehow challenged at, at the birth to three um, you know stage so all of this speaks to the, ch the the critical importance of early on so thank you for this and I, I certainly would do whatever I can to advocate for for more funding levels for sure thank you Pam then Michelle um, I think I'm cutting in front of Michelle but is that okay? uh, I didn't <laughs> okay. see Michelle so that's my <laughs> that's fault like, oh, I'm sorry are, but okay so um, again thank you sorry, for Michelle. the uh, for the presentation and um, just wanted to um, point out um, the fact that folks such as yourself, Dr. Mona, Hannah, Atisha, and those at the Department of Health and Human Services have been able to finally get across this connection between environmental exposures and especially at these early ages and don't want to at all minimize what's going on in Flint because we see those lead levels going up instead of down as we do in many of our communities. Um, but also want to point that many of the communities around the state, such as Saginaw, Detroit have mm -hmm. higher lead mm -hmm. levels and we also know that the housing stock that's there is not going to go away um, so again that just supports this need for these services and the funding to support those services um, and look forward to 
hearing what's going on in Flint so that we can also use this as an argument for the need uh, for um, other areas in the state. Thank you. Then Michelle, then Cassandra. Yeah. Yeah. This oh, I didn't is, um, have my hand up. It's a wonderful report. Well, I thought everybody decided they wanted it. I no. appreciate okay. um, I don't need to talk including to the Auditor General's right. uh, recommendations. We'll go to Rick. Uh, transparency Richard. on that. I had some um, questions with regard to the, um, <clears throat> the, uh, the uh, plan to comply with recommendations. It said explore process to change Michigan administrative rules for special education, include all infants and toddlers or change eligibility definition for early on. How would you change that? So we did do some exploration of that. Um, the, the challenge, of course, is a, is a policy challenge. If you change the um, eligibility, uh, the current el early on eligibility to map to the Michigan Mandatory Special Education, you exclude 60% of the children who have some, some delays but not severe enough to be able to garner that funding. And so we didn't want to go that route. Um, but at the same time that we were um, trying to um, address the concerns that were in the Auditor General report, there had just been a revision to the Michigan um, Administrative Rules for Special Education. And those, uh, the, the Office of Special Education wasn't ready to then redo the entire package and go out again. Uh, we had talked about possibility of creating a new categorical within the Michigan uh, administrative rules that mapped to the early on. We talked about the possibility of going in between somewhere. Um, and it was uh, at the same time that um, the Michigan, um, uh, the lieutenant governor was going through his um, investigations and um, um, the way in which he was garnering support from the community to learn more about special education. So it got put, paused, and on the back burner. Okay. And that, if you don't mind okay. me following oh. up, that, yep. if it's going to make it more inclusive, include more people, provide greater services, then it seems like there should be funding that has to go along with that in order to make it actually possible. Mm -hmm. So. Which is always uh, adding uh, adding an expanded eligibility into the administrative rules would then make more children qualify, which would then pull more money out of the state school aid act um, to uh, serve the children. And so there's a lot of things to take into consideration. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Richard, then Eileen, please. Um. How. How, how does the, how do you know when an intervention has right. been effective? How do you know when, when, I mean, you've got a record of services provided yes. to a, to a family. Um, how do you know whether that, that intervention, whether it be counseling or, or, uh, or change in <laughs> diet or, or whatever, or, or a particular mm -hmm. set of exercises to develop mm -hmm. something that has, has exactly. not been developed. How do you know when it's been effective or not? Well, when the children are presented too early on, when they first come in, as I mentioned, we do a multidisciplinary evaluation so we can get mm -hmm. some kind of status of their current level of development. And so you keep track of that and you keep measuring their development. There's a trajectory that's expected for children that are their age, and so the closer that child's development moves toward <laughs> that trajectory, then you know that what you're doing is making a difference. You're helping that child and family move forward and to try and get on that path of development that's expected for someone that age. Okay, Eileen. So yes, I too want to thank you. I just plunged right in because it's um, when you're waiting for information like this, it, it's really you get really greedy. <laughs> so my apologies. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask you several questions about the funding stream and how other states are doing it. Did Michigan ever fund uh, this program uh, before the recession, before the Great Recession? No, it did not. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then uh, how many states fund at what you uh, referred to as the very robust support level? Uh, how what is a percentage of that 47 or a number? Mm. Well, as we mentioned, there are like 40, Seven, 44, 44 that said that they had state funding <laughs> there. And some of the other states um, had to go to their state legislature to even start 
Right. I, I would expect RC. that. I, yeah. I, I'm not surprised to yep. hear that. Yeah. But, I, but you were able to quote very robust programs, so I was mm -hmm. curious at, at how many stand out. I don't know. We can get back yeah, to you on that. Yes, but it'd be interesting to know beca because maybe they've been, I would suspect that they've seen results just as Dr. Z was asking about how you measure it. Mm -hmm. yes. They've seen the results and so they're, they're mm -hmm. diverting funds or adding funds. Mm -hmm. their, their economies are in better shape than Michigan's and has there, been. And there have been states that pass laws to put more funding into Part C mm -hmm. as time goes on. The fact that um, when the federal government did get involved in uh, providing supports, early intervention supports to infants and toddlers. Michigan, because of our mandatory special ed, had already had support there. Also during that time, we had sister agencies with a lot more funding. Those things have changed over time. So that's what I was asking. Mm -hmm. I was curious to see whether right. there'd been a drop off of support, yes. and it sounds as if that's there the case, been. that we did have a priority based on this, but uh, probably during the last 10 years with the economy the way it was, the, yes. the other agencies funding dropped down and so the exactly. support hasn't been there. But it's, it's also the change, the model is really what I call a distributed model okay. with the assumption that there is flexible funding available in like the Department of Community Health and the Department of Health and Human Services to fund some of these services as we've moved into what I call heavy duty case management, where every dollar is allocated, well, there's not the flexible funding. They've lost uh, the flexible <coughs> allocation is lost, or the departments are doing something else with the money? The departments are doing something with the money that is already prescribed. Okay. Then I wanted to um, ask uh, about the evaluation trajectory. Uh, uh, your description of it strikes me mm -hmm. as being purely developmental. Is mm -hmm. there a, a, a pre-K-12 component in it also, or is it, having been around children who needed these services, I'm asking this more for all of us than I am for myself. But how does that look? Um, uh, it, uh, is it mostly health-based and um, uh, growth-based, or is it academic also? It's, I would say, more developmental. Mm -hmm and, and growth-based than academic. There, are, There is some academic component in that we want to make sure that the children are able to, uh, to acquire new knowledge and skills and the ability to, to uh, meet their own needs. Those are some of the child outcomes that we report to the feds mm -hmm. and that we have to do. Which is totally logical. So mm -hmm. then my last question, if you'll indulge me for one more minute, is that this strikes me, first, first of all, obviously we put all our eggs in the K-12 basket for special ed now at this point with the attrition of the other services and the money for it, the way that it's being handled. The question that I have is um, when we look at something like multi-tiered systems of support, the matchup to this seems totally logical to me, and yet I've not seen another state, when I look at MTSS, I've not seen another state that reaches down in any way, and I don't mm -hmm. know if that's going on, whether there's conversations about how to take these children, because MTSS, when it's done well, also reduces special ed costs by intervening very early. Um, and I don't know whether that's just a philosophical matchup or whether it could be a practical matchup. I don't, I don't know whether anybody's looked at that yet. I always ask these kinds of questions. Susan, you're laughing at me because I, you know, yeah, it's sort like, of like, okay, fine, you came in, and now yeah, I want to know how it's going to work next. I know. I know. <laughs> Sorry. No, we have not been included in the multi-tiered systems of support language. You know, I think that started K-12, and it's just now move to the preschool age or the three to five year uh, program, but they haven't gotten to birth to three yet. Well, having that kind of conversation puts tremendous value mm -hmm. on birth to three. Yes. Uh, because all of it is how do you get the services you need to the kids at the exactly. right time to reduce the expensive costs later on. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. Michelle? Yeah. <clears throat> and Eileen kind of get on my question. Sorry. Um, and I have known people who have, in my community, who have used early on, and it was a real godsend. Really has made a difference in, in people's lives. So I've seen that. Um, so uh, it, my question is, is, is are there any services that are Medicaid reimbursable? Mm -hmm. And so, yes. in, in if that's so, I know that there's that 
the ABA for kids with autism mm -hmm. is Medicaid eligible. Is that something that you're taking advantage of? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Okay. We work with mental health here in the state and make sure that we align our policies and procedures and okay. make sure that the families and children are aware of that resource and vice versa. And do you provide the services like within child care centers and things like that? <clears throat> as a, as we can provide? provide service, but not the ABA. That's done by mental health. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So that's a coordination it's expectation a coordination. on that in, on the IFSP. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they would they would do it in the daycare centers because uh, it's supposed to be in their the, natural environment or whatever. Yes. So according to this, it's supposed to be in their well. All of our services are in the natural environment. Right. Yes. So wouldn't they also be in, required to comply with the same? That mandate? I would need to. You can check it out and let yeah, us know. Yeah, I need to check that out okay, more because I'm not sure that that's how that works. I mean, we've worked, our staff, early on staff, have worked with the uh, autism um, committee and council to figure out how to best get families where they need to be and to receive that yeah. ABA service. Yeah, because if they're working, the parents yeah, are working, they I would know. need it in the daycare center. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you very much for the thank presentation. You. Appreciate the good information. Next item on the committee to hold agenda is a presentation on the State Board of Education statement and guidance on safe and supportive learning environments for lesbians, gay, bisexual, transgender, and questioning students. Due to a variety of factors, the school experience can be sig significantly more difficult for students with marginalized identities. Despite widespread <laughs> efforts, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and questioning students continue to face challenges that threaten their health, safety, and learning opportunities in schools. This effort has been a priority of Board President John Austin, who has worked with Michigan Teacher of the Year Rick Joseph and the Michigan Department of Education staff and community members on the issue. Today we'll be present a statement and guidance document. After the board meeting, we will submit these documents for public comment. Thank you, Brian. Uh, good morning, everybody. We're uh, pleased to uh, bring this guidance before the board uh, for discussion before we take out the public comment. Um, this uh, work represents six, six months of work with stakeholders, uh, both in state and nationally, um, on, on trying to develop additional guidance for schools. Um, you know, there's been an increased uh, number of requests uh, from Michigan districts on additional guidance to support families and their students who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgendered in questioning. Um, and you know, this is a sensitive, you know, and emotional issue for everyone, including our schools. And some they want to do as best they can by their students and support them and help create a learning environment that's conducive for them to be successful. And sometimes they don't know how to do that. So when when John approached us uh, last fall about some conversations he had had with, with students and parents uh, around the state, um, it just seemed like the right time to develop some additional guidance for schools as a means to show them, you know, how, what could be done both policy and implementation wise, I and mean, how you could go about doing that. So, uh, it was also, I was approached by a lot of educators, including Rick, who were asking, can, we're looking for help and, uh, and guidance from the board on how we support these kids. Would the board be interested in helping support us in developing thoughtful guidance? Right. Yes, absolutely. And I asked my colleagues if they would support that. Okay. And, and, and Rick has been a, a, a great supporter of us uh, in this work over the last six months. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Kim phillips Canope, who's really uh, helped lead uh, that process of how we got here today. Um, she's going to walk us through a presentation on kind of the background and the process um, and then and the um, actual guidance itself. Um, Kim has worked with schools throughout the U.S. on supporting efforts to include uh, increase uh, safe learning environments to kids, especially those who identify as LGBTQ. She's been honored uh, twice by the Michigan School Health Coordinators Association, and most recently as the recipient of the Children's Health Award for her work uh, in this area. And most importantly, she's a fellow East Lansing High School <laughs> alumni. Uh, she's a Trojan like myself, so that means she's, she's so With that, I turn it over to you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, let's see, so Mr. Chairman, Mr. President, board members, and others who are gathered, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to come and present and, and talk about the, um, the position statement and guidance on safe and supportive learning environments for LGBTQ students. Um, before I begin, I just want to 
recognize um, some folks uh, who were really critical to this process. Um, and I just would ask, there are folks who, we had dozens of key stakeholders who helped develop this pol uh, the position statement and guidance. And I would just ask if you were somebody who was a part of that process, you provided input, editing, um, uh, support any kind of input at all, if you um, would just either raise your hand or stand so that you can be recognized. There are a number of folks. Thank you very much. I also want to um, uh, acknowledge the thoughtful, inclusive, um, dedicated leadership of Lori Beckofer, um, who works in the Coordinated School Health and Safety Programs Unit. She has provided tremendous leadership um, on this process as well and has been working um, around these issues in Michigan for a very long time. Um, and she was a really critical piece of, uh, critical part of making sure that the, policy, uh, the position statement um, was based on, was well researched based on best practice and included um, the voices of, you know, key stakeholders from across the state. So thank you. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, you don't know me, <laughs> but I uh, am not somebody who believes in scare tactics. Um, we know that scare tactics don't really work, um, that when we sort of use fear to motivate people that we just don't, we're not very effective and we don't, um, we don't come up with creative and thoughtful um, solutions to issues. Um, that being said, I am somebody who believes in telling the truth. And in Michigan, we haven't done a very effective job of telling the truth about the experiences of LGBTQ students in the state. Um, and uh, so I just want to direct your attention to um, the slide. Sorry, it's a little, I know it's awkward <laughs> having the slides behind you and not looking at me. Um, nearly 11,000 lesbian, gay, and bisexual high school students in Michigan attempted suicide last year. And I say that not, um, again, not as a, as a way to scare you or to, you know, shock you in any way, but it's about telling the truth about the experiences of, of these students. And the <laughs> suicide attempts that are happening are the result of bullying and harassment. They're the result of social stigma, lack of acceptance. Um, and a number of other factors. And the, the, policy, uh, the position statement and guidance that we put together are designed to address the issues, the underlying issues that are at play um, to <coughs> address this epidemic that's happening in Michigan schools. Um, and, um, and to really provide some guidance for schools, some really like on the ground practical things that they can do to um, ensure that their students, all of their students, including those who are LGBTQ, have access to the same educational opportunities as every other student in our schools. <clears throat> um, LGBT students are often an invisible population in our schools. It's not an identity that you can necessarily, you know, know <coughs> by just looking at somebody. It's not like race or ethnicity in that way. And so um, we often just don't have a sense of what, what are we talking about? What do the numbers look like? Um, and thankfully, in the last two, um, the last two YRBS um, surveys that we've done in Michigan, we've included questions that allow us to get some demographic data on LGBT students, lesbian, gay, and bisexual students. We don't have information on transgender or questioning students, um, mostly because we haven't figured out, and the CDC hasn't figured out an effective way of asking the question. Um, but we do have good data on lesbian, gay, and bisexual students. Um, and just to give you a sense of like what the context is, so the number of LGB self-identified students um, is just a little bit less than the same number of Hispanic and Latino and Asian students in our high schools combined. So it's not a tiny population. Um, it's a relevant population, and we just might not know that they're there. Um, but it doesn't mean that they're not, you know, that they're not in our schools, and it doesn't mean that they're not being impacted by um, our policies and practices. <clears throat> and, I, um, and I will also say that I just want to remind us too that I think sometimes we can sort of forget that, um, that we all have intersectional identities and that we're not just one thing. I'm not just a woman. I'm not just an East Lansing High School graduate. Um, mm -hmm. That I'm multiple people at the same time, multiple identities. And the same is true for our LGBT students as well. So they're students of color. They're um, students with disabilities. They're students um, on in our homeless and runaway population. Um, and unfortunately, they're often disproportionately represented in, unfortunately, when it comes to homeless and runaway, um, um, not unfortunately when it comes to, you know, also having, um, uh, being people of color. But um, I just wanted to just remind folks that, um, that we're talking about LGBT students sort of cut across all demographics in our schools. 
Um, to give you a sense of what the experience is of LGBT, lesbian, gay, this data is just um, based on lesbian, gay, and bisexual students. Again, so this is going to be an under underrepresentation because it doesn't include transgender students who we know are at increased risk, and it doesn't include questioning students. Um, so, um, but to give you a sense of what, how their experiences compare to heterosexual students. Um, LGB students are uh, about two are 2.3 times more likely to have been threatened or injured with a weapon on school property, um, and this is all in the last 12 months. Um, and this is sorry, just to clarify too, this is 2015 data, so this is last year, last school year. They're about uh, 2.3 times more likely to skip school because they felt unsafe. You can imagine that if you're being physically verbally assaulted at school that you might not want to show up at school, that it might not feel like a safe place to go every day. Um, they're 1.7 times more likely to get C's, D's, and F's in school. Again, if you don't feel safe and you're not going to school, then it's going to be harder for you to you know, meet the academic rigor um, to get A's and B's in, in class. Um, and then um, the last one which I you know, uh, referenced earlier is that they're um, about four and a half times more likely to have attempted suicide in the last 12 months. <clears throat> so we know from decades and decades of research what students need in order to, f to succeed in school. Um, and you'll see Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, this is um, sort of adapted to um, for schools, and we know, you know, they, they have to have physiological needs met, food, water, shelter, they need to be able to sleep, things like that. Um, most of that schools don't have a lot of control over, um, but school safety, the sense of belonging, um, those are things that schools have a responsibility um, to ensure, you know, when students come to school that they feel safe. We require them by law to go to school, um, and we have a responsibility to make sure that they feel safe and are um, included. And we know that if we do those things, that they're much more likely to succeed academically, socially, developmentally. Um, and without them, that learning transfer can't happen. <clears throat> um, so the great thing here is that there's a solid foundation for this guidance um, within um, both uh, the Department of Education and with the State Board of Education. Uh, in 2005, um, the State Board adopted the universal, the vision and principles of universal education um, and recognized in that document sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression. Liz Bauer, yes. the <laughs> architect of um, this, is here. She's yeah. sitting there. <laughs> um, <laughs> We're still using it. So, um, so the State Board adopted these policy, uh, this um, principles and vision, uh, and included sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression as important populations to consider. Um, also, our uh, model code of student conduct, um, the State Board model sort of code of student conduct includes sexual orientation and gender identity. That model anti-bullying policy includes sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression. And the guidance that we um, developed also aligns with um, the Michigan Department of Education's most recent, recent strategic plan um, to be one of the top 10 um, states in the country in the next 10 years. Um, and so the, again, the, the, the guidance aligns with those, um, the strategic plan as well. Um, also, thankfully, the request um, for this position statement and guidance came after considerable capacity had already been built within um, Michigan uh, and within the Department of Education despite limited funding. So we've had, um, for almost 15 years, we've had a state-level work group um, that's provided guidance and includes key stakeholders from across the state, um, from um, elementary through higher ed and um, youth have been on it, parents have been on it, sort of various constituencies have been represented. Um, we also have a resource guide um, that looks like this. I'd be happy to pass it around. Um, it's in its sixth edition. Um, it's been used, um, uh, over 4,000 copies have been, are being used in over 35 states um, across the country. Um, and it's considered a model um, resource guide, not just for Michigan, but also for other states and um, districts across the country. It's being used. Um, we've heard great things from Massachusetts. Los Angeles Unified School District has distributed it to employees. Um, so we're pretty proud of this um, resource guide as well. 
We also um, have for years have been getting requests from school districts to provide trainings. So we have developed two day-long trainings that focus on LGBT issues um, and providing supports for schools to uh, meet the needs of those students. Uh, for 15 years we've delivered, over 15 years we've delivered 60 workshops, <coughs> it's about four per year. Um, we've trained uh, 20, over 2,200 people from 322 districts across the state, reaching over a million students. Um, and we have more requests than ever before for these trainings. Um, we have had to cap the participation and um, we have wait lists at every training that we do, um, which is a great problem to have. Um, but um, it just tells us that the need is great and people are really interested and want to know more. They want the information. <clears throat> and then lastly, we continue to provide um, uh, coaching support to districts. Um, from administrators and school counselors and teachers to um, students and parents, we get contacted by folks on a regular basis and also around providing professional development training for folks. So um, more and more requests are coming in from districts across the state. <clears throat> in terms of state laws, as you are aware, we have a, our Michigan, um, the Matt Epling Safe School Law exists um, and requires schools to have an anti-bullying policy. Um, it, uh, we also have, it doesn't enumerate, it also doesn't require training. Those are, um, that's not necessarily best practice and so and is not research based in terms of having the impact that we want to have in schools in terms of addressing bullying and harassment um, and curbing it. And so um, when the state, it's wonderful when the state board put out their recommendations, they do enumerate and they recommend um, uh, professional development training for staff. So, um, so that's good. Um, our Civil Rights Act, the Elliott Larson Civil Rights Act, currently does not include sexual orientation, gender identity, or expression. Um, you can see the list of protected classes that are included. Um, individuals who identify as LGBT in the state of Michigan are not protected from discrimination in employment, public accommodation, or housing. Um, to put it bluntly, you could be fired in Michigan for being gay, which um, is a concern, especially among um, educators, um, are at particular risk for something like that. And so um, this is a different issue around LGBT students because there are no legal protections in the state um, for this particular population. Um, and so the risks can be greater um, in that regard. <clears throat> From uh, when we're looking at federal law, the Office for Civil Rights, <coughs> excuse me, and Title IX are probably what come into play most for school districts. The Office of Civil <coughs> Rights um, has interpreted um, Title IX to bar discrimination on the basis of gender identity and expression. Um, they've had two dear colleague letters that have come out um, in 20, <coughs> excuse me, in 2010 and 2011 that um, provide information for school districts across the country um, about that interpretation and they have been um, they have been investigating school districts I'm guessing you may have heard <laughs> there's been quite some public attention and media attention um, around the Office uh, for Civil Rights and their investigations um, Michigan has a handful of districts that are currently being investigated by the Office for Civil Rights related to um, mishandling of um, or complaints that have been filed on behalf of LGBT students. So this is an issue not just nationally in other states, but it's it's happening currently here in Michigan. And the guidance that we put together, um, we spoke with the Office for Civil Rights, and um, the guidance that we provide will help school districts be in compliance with Title IX. <coughs> So the process for developing this statement, we talked to everybody we could possibly think of who um, we thought would be a key stakeholder and have an important voice um, to share in the process. <clears throat> um, we were very thoughtful about it. We tried, we were very purposefully, um, uh, purposeful about the process. We were, tried to be inclusive. It's very well researched and we wanted to make sure that everything that was in it was um, well researched and based on best practice and part of our way of doing that was to review existing statements and policies. There are a number of states and um, school districts, large school districts around the country that already have policies and guidance in place um, and statements in place so we reviewed those um, places like Massachusetts, New York, Maryland, Los Angeles Unified, San Francisco Unified, Washington DC, Texas, just to name a handful. <clears throat> we also had um, discussions with major um, policy and law firms here in Michigan. So we talked to Neola 
Um, we talked um, to lawyers at Kroon um, and at Luskin Albertson also to get their input and guidance. Um, we had discussions with national partners, so we spoke with people at the American Psychological Association. The Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education has been addressing these issues for a very, very, very long time, and so we spoke with them. Um, uh, we also, as I mentioned, talked with the Office for Civil Rights and other um, organizations with expertise um, specifically on LGBT issues. Um, we also, sorry, I'm, sorry. I'm slow, slow out, man. <laughs> Um, we also we also reviewed um, the technical assistance requests that we've been getting from school districts to make sure that we were providing guidance in the areas that school districts are asking for. Um, and then finally, we researched um, you know best practices, record keeping practices here in Michigan. We talked to folks at CEPI. We looked into how name changes, um, legal name changes happen. Um, and how schools handle those things. Um, we also spoke with the Michigan High School Athletic Association to talk to them about their policies um, to make sure that the guidance aligned with, um, with the work that they're doing as well. And then <coughs> we started writing. Um, and this just gives you a, a sense of some examples of different, um, different guidance that we looked at and different um, policies and um, statements that exist. Um, and this list is um, just provides you um, an exa examples of different stakeholders that we got input from. So you'll see um, a number of um, the uh, statewide associations, um, different key, you know folks who represent different key constituencies for schools represented. Um, we also had um, <coughs> uh, pediatricians, school uh, clinical psychologists, folks from higher education, special education, early childhood. Um, pupil accounting, parents, students, community organizations, legal counsel. Um, we really, as I said, we really tried to have a diverse, um, diverse voices at the table to make sure that the policy and, uh, excuse me, that the position statement and guidance were going to um, <laughs> meet the needs of, of folks in the um, in representing these different constituencies. About 45 people from these different groups attended um, our review meeting of the draft um, position statement and then 20 additional people provided input um, either electronically by the phone or in one other one-on-one -on -one meetings that um, who weren't able to attend the review meeting and then so um, and then we have the, the document itself um, I think that you all have a copy of the document in your packets if you wouldn't mind just pulling them out I wanted to um, I uh, highlight a couple of things within the within the position statement and guidance. Like oh, yeah. um, okay. 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 Is that okay? okay. Yeah. Better? Okay. We're good. All right. Our shift okay. is over. Yeah. It's not like an alarm. <laughs> 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 All right. So the first thing I want to draw your attention to um, is just that there's a list of definitions that are here. It's not an all-inclusive list, um, but we did want to make sure that the relevant definitions were included so that folks, as they were reading it, had a, um, we were sort of on the same page uh, in our understanding of some different language that's being used. Um, <coughs> the next section of the document um, provides sort of an overview of the rationale, why we're looking, um, why, why we would want to provide um, additional guidance around this particular population. So it includes data um, and talks about how it aligns with the Department of Education Top 10 and 10 strategic plan. Um, and it also speaks to the sort of disproportionate risk that these, these students are facing. <clears throat> uh, on the next page, it um, you get into the actual um, recommendations, the eight, um, the eight overall recommendations. Um, and I just want to point out that um, it says that the state board encourages districts to, um, to do these things. It does not require them. There's no, um, you know, there's no, uh, we're not dictating that schools do anything that they don't want to. It would be a choice that they could make. Um, you know, obviously we are a very local control and we would want districts to adopt policies and practices that aligned with what their needs were in their in their district um, but as I said we've gotten so there's so much so much requests from districts to have <laughs> some guidance about what that could look like um, and so that's where the, um, that's where these eight recommendations come from um, they also align with what other states and and urban you know large urban school districts and other school districts that have um, adopted um, policies and statements and guidance um, and again, their research-based best practice. Um, 
and you'll see that you know uh, adopting implementing and enforcing policies that are inclusive is the first one providing professional development anytime we adopt policies you know our policies are only as good as people know that they exist and understand what they are and what the expectation is of them and so we always want to provide um, or at least encourage folks to provide um, professional development training on you know any new policies or practices so everybody's on the same page and they understand what the expectations are um, and that would be up to local school districts to determine for themselves um, additional I'm not going to go through every single one of them but um, you know they focus on sort of using if you're looking back at Maslow's hierarchy of needs you'll see that they connect um, they align with those and look at school connectedness um, family connectedness uh, inclusive talk about inclusive curriculum and access to resources for students um, they also include schools um, to collect data and then use that data to reflect on what's working um, and what isn't working um, we have YRBS data so it wouldn't you know they wouldn't need to do extra work and the office for civil rights is already requiring that they are reporting some of this data so it's not the recommendations don't wouldn't be asking schools necessarily to choose they could choose to do more but most of they could get a lot of information that they wanted in reports that they were already already be putting together it's just encouraging them to look at the data a little bit differently <laughs> are you okay <laughs> i think my chair is rebelling yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i think it's pneumatic don't worry about okay. it there's something going on inside but all, right. all right all right thank you okay. just check in <laughs> Oh we have another <laughs> really trade out. I know. <laughs> <laughs>
um, that that's the best thing that we can do is support acceptance among um, uh, among these students and that if we are accepting and support them um, that their yeah mental health issues basically go away and become the same they have the same risk factors as any other student I just want to reinforce it's not because they're gay or trans that they're at risk, um, it's because we're not, in all cases, welcoming them and supporting exactly. them. Exactly. And I guess I just want to reinforce how important this is and how needed it is from my colleagues. Um, if 9%, if and that's not even counting the growing number of kids who are trans, who are mm -hmm. now more comfortable in being who they are, that's a lot of our young people. And there are a set of conditions, and many schools are developing them, that can help all of these young people learn and be welcomed and be safe and get about the business of getting an education. And this number of young people, it's more than Latino and Asian, it's almost as many as African American. We would never question if we should do some specific things or encourage some specific things to meet the learning needs of our African American or Latino students to help them do better. And we need to encourage some things that help our uh, schools support the learning needs of our LGBTQ students. Uh, and as you can see, there's incredible thoughtful educators and experts who put this together, including our own Rick Joseph, who I hope will speak to it. Um, and I know we all now, I think, know more, I certainly do, of these young people. And I would just, again, remind us, they're not choosing to be gay or trans. They're um, who they are and we're meant to be. And uh, we can either embrace them and help them thrive and welcome them, or we can stigmatize them and push them away. And as you can see, uh, put them at risk. So I strongly encourage us to um, embrace and to encourage public discussion and input and to improve too the kind of guidance because um, Eileen and others I know there's some language uh, changes that would be helpful probably that would help uh, make this very explicit and fact-based uh, which I appreciate the effort to do. So this is very important to help more of our kids learn and that we should keep as our focus. Sandra, is that a hand up? <laughs> oh, I was just, I just want to clarify. So this is going out for public comment. When, where, and how is that going to happen? Kyle, public we'll, comment. We'll, we'll do a, a combination of, of online. Um, there'll be an online feedback process. Um, uh, we'll probably take it to some specific groups. As you saw, the stakeholder list was pretty, pretty vast. If there are people you have in mind that you want to make sure we specifically reach out to, we, we can do that as well. But we're going to keep the public comment period open a little longer than what we normally do. We normally do like a four-week period, you know, make it back to the next board meeting. But we're, we've slated to bring this back in May to give some extra time for, for that feedback. Thank you. Well, I, I'm, I'm very supportive of um, doing whatever we can to help um, children thrive in our public schools. And I think that there are a lot of, of children who, and young people, um, who would fall into these categories uh, and I think you're absolutely right John that we can't stigmatize them um, they are as entitled to a appropriate education as everybody else and they're also entitled to be who they are so uh, and if schools are asking for this kind of um, guidance then we should take that role seriously and we should provide it All right I had uh, Eileen and then Kathleen oh thank you and I'm sorry my chair was missing. Maybe I had nothing to do with the PA system. Um, I, I wanted to say that we had a very compelling and powerful presentation from OK to Say several months ago. And I didn't know whether the work that you're doing is at all tied into the anti-bullying, anti-suicidal efforts that the Department of Justice, Attorney, General. Attorney General's Office mm -hmm. is doing. Um, I don't know whether that, it, it, on, on the state level, whether you're doing anything with them. I mean, can you speak louder? I'm so sorry. I'm sort of rumbly today. Um, what, I, what I was saying is that we had a very compelling presentation on suicides in general and children at risk, marginalized children, from OK to Say, which is the Attorney General's office, yeah. back okay. in the fall, right. I think. Yeah. yeah. And I, I was just on their website, and they list this as one of maybe seven or eight societal mm -hmm. factors that are, in other words, it's not, it is part of the, of the way that we look at all children. Mm -hmm. We know that there are certain risks that are inherent for kids who are um, in family troubles, mm -hmm. um, in inner city schools where there's opportunities for um, early um, uh, criminalization mm -hmm. of uh, the pipeline you know, mm -hmm. to, to prison. I, 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 I am always, um, because I have a 15 year old, uh, in high school, I'm always passionate about these uh, uh, conversations mm -hmm. arising because they are 
an effort to raise our consciousness on the, our, on the kids who just need to be our social members and be accepted. Mm -hmm. So I, I have no trouble with that, but I think that probably you should be working with them mm -hmm. because it doesn't seem to me to have the dominance in their overall picture mm. that you're portraying for the number of suicides. Mm -hmm. And this num the level of suicide was very high. I can't remember what it was, but it was astonishing. It was you know, nearly half the kids, I think. Or, I mean, it was a number that just left me breathless. Mm -hmm. So um, knowing some coordination mm -hmm. with them might be useful because it, it could be that their website could be uh, stronger mm -hmm. for, for this purpose. Um, and that's one thing. And then, um, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I was reading this morning about New York City, which has been on its voyage since 2002, mm -hmm. to try to figure out how you share bathrooms mm -hmm. in a civilized society. And uh, it is it is one of those, it's a flashpoint. Uh, John emailed me yesterday, I think you said Nebraska had outlawed. The South Dakota was South Dakota. legislating which bathroom you could go to based yeah. on the your birth gender. Yeah. And, and, and people oh pick funny <laughs> things to fixate mm -hmm. on. So um, uh, social change is very complicated. New York City is just now getting to the point where they're legislating or requiring, I've forgotten the semantics mm -hmm. and I don't have it open. After, after passing this in 2002, they're only now getting around to requiring that unisex bathrooms in public places be able to be used by either gender, by mm -hmm. anybody. Um, and so you, you, look, you look at this and you think, how are we going to get there as a state? Mm -hmm. So my initial reaction, my computer is off, but I, I did have, as John knows, I had some trouble with the language yesterday because I felt that without intending to be, it was actually exclusive to other children who were being mm -hmm. bullied and who were, were at risk for suicide. Mm -hmm. The question will be on this, how to include, mm -hmm. from my perspective, if there's editing, there were two issues. One was making sure that this was not a carve out for um, one group of kids mm -hmm. at the expense of other people. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's easy ways to do that within the document. There's some th some wording that I would pull back or I would add to mm -hmm. and just say, you know, this is true in any bullying yeah. situation, any social situation that excludes children. Mm -hmm. But there's one phrase in there early on about how the State Board of Ed accepts a bunch of things that I'm not sure we all do, all do mm -hmm. but we all agree that the outcome should be different. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. um, and then the other issue that I had you've already covered, which is that these are not mandated, but they mm -hmm. are very specific. Mm -hmm. And someplace in that journey that New York City is on between legislating bathroom use and not having it happen, and a document that goes out to many people and could provoke um, the kind of legislation that John's citing, is an answer that gets us to where we go fast. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what that is, but I want to make sure that we don't, that we're not seen as pushing a social agenda mm -hmm. versus solving a social issue. Mm -hmm. That's extremely important if we're going to make uh, uh, fast progress and mm -hmm. not have people, you know, saying, wait, wait, yeah. why are we doing this? Certainly. And the goal should be that every child can come into a school building and walk out four years later with a degree that makes sense to that person mm -hmm. and a life ahead of them. Absolutely. And anything that we do that narrows that window for other people by accident or focuses um, <coughs> on one group in a, in a way that uh, doesn't allow everybody to be pulled along mm -hmm. won't really get us where we want to go as fast as, I mean, it will, mm -hmm. but it just isn't going to be as fast. Yeah. I appreciate so much your perspective and, um, and really hear, you know, your concern about wanting to you know, make sure that it's not a carve out and it's not, you know, sort of a dictate for school districts on how, to, how they have to do things and things like that. Um, and we shared those, you know, as we were as we were putting together the document. And you know, one of the things, uh, just to respond to a couple of your, um, just to sort of let you know what our intention was in terms of how we were how we were developing um, these and addressing, you know, your concerns was really first in making sure, you know, that in terms of like the bathroom issue and not wanting to like sort of isolate students and things like that and ha how is it going to affect other students is you know the the guidance itself says and that we you know every student should be able to use the bathroom in school and that's what, what it comes down to and we need to make sure that we're accommodating the needs of all the all students and so we need to accommodate the needs of transgender students and we also need to accommodate the needs of not non-transgender students um, and that it's about working with those students individually um, and coming up with a solution that works for them so that everybody can go to the bathroom at school it seems you know it seems like a small thing and it's also a really critical issue it's a bodily function we have it gets to that physiological you know um, 
uh, part of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If we can't go to the bathroom, we, we literally can't learn. <laughs> and so wanting to make sure that all students have access to the bathroom and that all of their needs are met and accommodated for, um, and not wanting to you know, isolate or um, prevent any student from, from using a bathroom that they feel comfortable in. Um, and so the guidance really tries to address that um, in working with students who are comfortable with going to the bathroom with transgender students and those who might want to use a different bathroom. We want to work with those students as well and this provides guidance for how to do that um, for both students. I would say the hard part on this is that some schools are on the fastest on-ramp possible mm -hmm. and others could dig their heels in with the same advice Absolutely. that you might give yep. urban districts that yep. are used to this conversation. Mm -hmm. Others could dig their heels in and never get to a spot that yep. for their kids to need it. It just isn't, it's, it's a delicate balance and mm -hmm. I applaud um, I you for, <coughs> for moving forward on it. Mm -hmm. You have to articulate the best case you can mm -hmm. for, these, for these students. We may need to find a broader balance for all children with these children's needs being articulated mm -hmm. very well mm -hmm. to make sure we all go, we move all the kids where they need to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and I think, um, you know, uh, that's sort of the goal of the of the document and if you know we need to look at tweaking language here and there to make sure that that happens and certainly you know we want that feedback um, and um, to address your your question too about wanting to make sure that we're not moving one group forward at sort of the risk of leaving others behind um, I would just um, I'm encouraged to to hear um, and to have um, read research that shows that when we are inclusive of LGBT students, that all students benefit from it, not just LGBT students. And that um, if you look at um, policies and practices that are in place, that if we don't specifically name sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression, those anti-bullying policies don't have an impact. But when we do include sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression, we see lower rates of bullying and um, a stronger sense of safety within the school, not just for students, but as reported by staff and like principals and staff. So, um, so, so in terms of you know, wanting to make sure that we're bringing everybody along, that's what this does. It brings everybody along. And it's not about prioritizing one group over another. It's, um, it's, it's not an either or, it's a both and, because everybody benefits when we're meeting, um, when we're meeting the needs and, in, uh, and creating safe school environments for um, our most marginalized students. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so Thank Eileen, you. you're going to submit some language to us? Yeah, I can. Yeah. I can take a look at things that I think wouldn't get you to your goal. And then the, the other issue that I can't address is um, the sense of social agenda. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I don't, I don't um, that's not my issue, but it definitely, mm -hmm. I think, is there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, a feeling of uh, great concern that this is uh, an effort to broaden somehow the reach of the LGBTQ mm -hmm. community. And mm -hmm. I, can't, I can't help with that. I got you, Rick. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks, Eileen. Kathleen, and then Rick, please. <coughs> Well, thank you for this it, very good work, I think. And I, I, it's absolutely necessary. I, I, support, I, support the, I support it. But I wanted to say that <clears throat> it's, been, it's a growing area. I mean, do, looking at this all over, the last January, the January issue of Education Update from ASCD, has a big article on charting a course to transgender inclusion. This came up before mm -hmm. our proposal here, and I, you know, reading it. And I was at a at a meeting last week and met the the chairman of the board of the Arts Academy in the Woods, which is a charter school in in Warren, and it was chartered by Macomb ISD. And uh, some or other brought up this whole business of of LGBT mm -hmm. uh, students, and I said this was on our agenda. She said, well, you know, we have a policy. So she sent me their policy. <laughs> it's very similar, mm -hmm. and it, it, it's, it's uh, part of their anti-bullying policy, mm -hmm. they, they refer to it. I have a copy, she sent it to me. If anybody wants to see it, it's, it's a charter school. And it's, school. It's, uh, very Where was good. that meeting you were at? Yeah. <laughs> 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 so, uh, and my daughter, who was a social worker in Nebraska, working with the elderly, went to a workshop for social workers a couple of weeks ago, and the presentation was on LGBT students. And she said it was fascinating, the, the stories that the presenter 
told about uh, a family uh, in Omaha of that three boys, two of them twins, twin boys. <clears throat> and by the time the little one of the twins was two years old, he wanted to wear dresses. He, he, he just wanted, he wanted to be, a, he said he was a girl. Mm -hmm. And he, he wore dresses, and when he went to school, went to Catholic school, and he wanted to wear the girls' uniform. And they took him to a, you know, they took him to a therapist. But anyway, they supported his being a transgender child. Mm -hmm. Had to take him out of the Catholic school because really? they wouldn't tolerate it. But he's in a public school now, and or she, she's in a public mm -hmm. school now. <laughs> but from the time he was two years old. Mm -hmm. uh, so the things that are happening that people are talking about now, that if they were happening before, they weren't talked about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and we didn't know about it, so what we didn't know, we didn't do anything about mm -hmm. it. Now we know a lot more, and we have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And I think it's absolutely time for us to, to take this kind of action. And, you know, if you want to change a few words here or there, that's <coughs> fine. But the basic outline of the guidance is really essential. And, oh, about, oh, I don't know, about eight or nine months ago, maybe a year ago, I got a call from one of the United States District Judges in Detroit who had a case dealing with a, a mm -hmm. transgender child and the bathroom issue. Mm -hmm. And I know that that's a major issue with mm -hmm. flashpoint with people in the community. Well, he called, up, called me up because he knew I'm on the state board. <laughs> but did we have anybody to help him? Well, we did. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was happy because he needed help in how to deal with this case. So it's, it's burgeoning, mm -hmm. and I think it's time for us to take this action. Thank you, Thank Kathleen. You. Thank you. Rick? Um, I, first of all, I really do want to recognize both Kim and Lori Beckoff or her colleague from the <coughs> department, because they, they, raise your hand, Lori, because they've done it out just a, a yeoman-like work around this issue for years and years and years, and this is certainly not something that has just come upon us. Um, I can tell you in my 21 years as an educator that this is certainly a, a concern of mine. <coughs> and if you consider the fact that there's 1.5 million public school students in the state of Michigan, that means about 150,000 of them identify roughly as LGBTQ students. And, and even um, a, a small percentage of those kids who may be at some risk indicate to me as a public educator that this is, a, this is a moral, not only a moral imperative to address, but it's a public health um, crisis that's just ongoing. And we talk a lot about Flint as being, you know, facing a, a water crisis, which it certainly does. But this is not this is a crisis for educators that we face every day because there's a three to four times um, higher rate of suicide among children who identify as LGBTQ. Um, and there is a, an overrepresentation in the homeless population um, due to the fact that, that families, many families who have children who are LGBTQ simply reject them. They kick them out. And I grew up in a very conservative Catholic home going to Mass every Sunday. And that did not include um, an acknowledgement of, um, of homosexuality as a, as, a, as a legitimate lifestyle, if you will. But it took, at the age of 18, my f the, the introduction to people who are gay to change my perspective. Because fundamentally, I met people who were lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. And over time, my understanding and my perception changed. And I was able to develop um, an ethic of compassion. And as an educator, I have to be compassionate in order to educate. Mm -hmm. And we know as teachers that students don't care what you know until they know that you care. And I cannot teach kids if they feel that I um, don't see them as, as their full human self. And if I'm critical of who they are as human beings, and fundamentally, what what I think this this, rec this these recommendations do is they say you exist on a fundamental level, and it's that basic recognition that helps create the necessary relationships in schools that saves kids' lives. Because if kids don't feel connected, if they don't feel part of a community, if they don't feel that they belong, then they become ostracized isolated, and many of them are already ostracized and isolated from their own family. If they feel that way within schools, then, then we get into these issues that lead to what we have now, which is uh, the, the alienation, which may lead to suicide, frankly. And the data bears us out. I'm, I'm not making this up. It's not as if 
it, you know, Rick Joseph said this, but <laughs> this, is, this is the national crisis. So I'm thrilled that this is finally coming before the board table. Um, last month I read this book, I Am Jazz, by Jessica Hurthal and Jazz Jennings. And, and this book I only came upon a few months ago. But this explains in simplest terms the, the, the reality of life for people who are transgender and how they come to the realization that they are, in fact, um, transgender. And so I encourage people to look at this book again um, and, and read it again, but, but look at all the other research and look at all the other data that's out there as well. But the power of the narrative is what always sticks with me. And I think because our brains are wired for story, because they're wired for narrative, this is what resonates most. It's the human story. It's the human story of, of, of one family's condition. And if you look at that photograph up there on the screen, you'll see that it's not just one or two people, but it's a significant number of people throughout the state, throughout, um, throughout our country, who are dealing with issues, especially uh, related to our, our students who are transgender, because <coughs> oftentimes they are the, the least understood population in schools. Certainly for myself, um, my, my learning curve is still quite steep, and I still um, have a lot of learning to do myself. But again, I want to thank um, Kim and Lori for their work. I want to thank John for your support, and everybody for your willingness to learn, and your willingness to grow, and your willingness to um, address this, because at the end of the day, um, that's what we need to do. So thank you. Thank you. Richard, please. I'd like and to make the turn. case okay. for the traditional uh, understanding of these issues. The traditional understanding of uh, development is that we are born with certain appetites which are connected with our, our need, uh, but we have to be trained in order to make right use or desirable use of them. So for example, a child is born, finds that the lead paint chips tastes sweet. That child has to be taught not to follow his or her inclinations because that behavior is dysfunctional, it's unhealthy, it's poisonous. Now every culture develops its own recipe. If you look at traditional uh, kosher laws, you'll find that, you know, those slimy shellfish are, are unclean. And, and many of us, you know, when we first encountered a slimy shellfish, uh, or escargot probably agree. But on the other hand, the satisfying crunch of a locust is not exactly part of our cultural recipe for what's good and healthy to eat. I'm just pointing out that there are some variations in the way cultures have, a, have adopted these things. Now, if this is true with a basic appetite like eating, and if you neglect uh, the basic principles of nutrition, do you pay the price in your health? And we hear that about overeating and, and things of that nature. This is also true about our sexual appetites. They are inchoate. They have to be trained and formed. When schools were first established in America, it was with that idea that children would be given a model of virtue, of sexual or gender role models, um, uniforms, which the Clintons advocated way back when, uh, was an example of this. Traditionally, schools have had a role in teaching normative uh, roles in our society. And whereas you may have come from a society where the men wore uh, full-length uh, gowns as they do in the Middle East, or maybe kilts as they do in Scotland, uh, in America, in many schools, you had a dress code simply to adapt. Now, arguably, some of these rules are arbitrary. Uh, you know, you could, write, you could drive on the left, you could drive on the right. Uh, but if you ignore that arbitrary rule in America, you're much more likely to get into a crash and get killed. So I'm saying that the traditional approach to these issues, which seeks to define roles and influence children's identity, before it's formed, as Maslow, as um, Erickson points out in the adolescent crises, uh, is something that traditionally schools have implemented. I think they need the freedom to continue to implement. And the philosophy and ideas behind the recommendations of the department are contrary and frankly would be foreign to the majority of American parents. So I cannot support the recommendation. All right, Pam, please. 
Um, I just had a question about the data that you showed, and I was reminded of this when Rick talked about this issue as a public health issue. And I'm wondering if you had thought about pulling some of the um, BRFS or the youth um, survey risk data, um, looking at um, lifestyle um, as it relates to children who are not um, supported around their LGBT, um, mm -hmm. around those standards. Do you, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, we I can, mean, we, we we can aggregate some of the other data, like nutrition behaviors, other type of behaviors, to get a better picture. I don't know. I'm looking to Kim if we've done that already. Or are you talking about like family, like family acceptance, and the role that that would play? I'm not, I just want to clarify. Right. What I mean, is it your yeah? And for? I don't know if we can. Mm -hmm. um, tease some of that data out, but I know that um, I've looked at data around mm -hmm. HIV, um, mm -hmm. yeah. that, that behavior that would lead to that outcome, mm -hmm. um, and how children that are not accepted or not, you know, that they're not having these conversations where it may lead, uh, more likely to lead to mm -hmm. behaviors that could end up in that public health crisis that, mm -hmm. that we know is in our community. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I don't know that we can do that with our YRBS data because we don't ask questions about. And I, I know I've seen this data, that, but it might be as re, as it relates to there, adult. But I know that there are some risk behavior is. questions, but I don't know mm -hmm. if that can. I will say that there's a national. Sorry, ahead, do you wanna? Ahead. I was just gonna say there's a there's a, a study that was done um, by an organization through um, San Francisco <coughs> um, State University called the Family Acceptance Project, and they did research that looks very specifically at um, the impact that family acceptance or rejection has on risk education, health and educational risks for mm -hmm. um, and outcomes for LGBT. Um, kids um, and so there is data that looks very specifically at, at that um, it's not Michigan specific so um, it doesn't necessarily speak to the experiences of you know the 36,000 plus you know high school students or whatever you know whatever we have for our YRBS um, <coughs> but there is for sure there's research that shows that there's a connection between those so I things. know that MPHI Michigan Public Health mm -hmm. Institute and DHHS and many partners throughout the state have just done some assessment data and they may have looked at I know that they were going to collect some uh, primary data so we may mm -hmm. want to um, look at that, but mm -hmm. I think that that, in addition to the suicide rates, mm -hmm. may be very um, helpful in stating the case mm -hmm. for the need for this. Yeah, uh, we can share the, the 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 research that Kim's referring to, as well as aggregate the data that we do collect mm -hmm. through YRBS based on based on this data, so you can see those kind of other risk factors. And I mean, to, I don't know that it gets to the family lifestyle piece, I think, mm -hmm. as part of what you're looking yeah. at, and we'll also work with HHS. I mean, it can be beyond family. I mean, mm -hmm. if they don't have the support yeah. systems, that, mm -hmm. that it could lead to, mm -hmm. to that type of behavior. So yeah. it definitely could relate to um, the education mm -hmm. system. Absolutely. But. Okay, uh, out of respect, I'm already kept Natasha Baker a half hour. I'm going to move on, but we will come back to this. We're not going to leave this totally. We will come back to this conversation after Natasha. But I have kept her waiting for a half hour. So I, out of respect for Natasha, I am going to be done with this. No, we're going to come back to it because other people want to speak. So we're going to come back to it. So we'll come back. But I'm going to call up Natasha Baker uh, to make a presentation on the state school reform officer. Thanks, Kim. Thanks, Kyle. As we work to provide the best uh, possible education for all children in Michigan, it's important. I think that's yours. Right. I'm, I'm going to wait a second. On their website. Oh, yeah. I'm going to go get some Oh, okay. Yeah, you can put them on. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You good, Natasha? I am. Okay. Hello. All right. As we work to provide the best possible education for all children in Michigan, it's important that the partners work together to benefit all of our students. Today, Natasha Baker, State School Reform Officer uh, from the Michigan Department of Technology Management and Budget, is here to share information on the work of the State School Reform Office in supporting our lowest performing schools. We welcome Natasha back to the board table and look forward to the conversation. Natasha, thank you for being here, and I apologize for having you up here a half hour late.
I think you better go, just go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, my name is Natasha Baker, and I'm the State School Reform Officer. I'm also a former teacher, dean, principal, chief academic officer, and chief innovation officer, largely in high poverty urban areas in different parts of the country. Today's presentation is around four guiding questions. The first of which is, what is the SRO and what do we do? The second, what are the academic trends for priority schools? The third, how does the SRO collaborate with stakeholders, superintendents, state agencies, ISDs, and measure progress in priority schools in time for mid-course corrections? And the fourth is, what necessitates SRO intervention, which is about the identification factor, and why is SRO intervention necessary, which is largely around rationale? I'll begin with the first question, what is the SRO and what do we do? On slide four, and the slide numbers are in the upper right-hand corner, it lists the authorities and responsibilities of the SRO under the revised school code as well as the executive order. Under state statute, um, the responsibilities include uh, assigning the lowest uh, achievement of, the lowest achieving 5% of schools to the SRO. Re it also requires priority schools to submit reform redesign plans a grant's authority to implement intervention if academic progress is not made, which in includes the CEO operator for multiple schools as well as the reform district. But it also provides exemptions for districts under emergency management. To that point, the executive order uh, transferred duties and responsibilities of the SRO from the Michigan Department of Education to the Department of Technology Management and Budget. Our goals are listed here. Um, first, I always begin with our mission to turn priority schools into the highest performing schools in, in, the, in the state. Um, our vision is to move schools from the bottom 5% to the top 25% of schools. Um, and I always like to share that with folks because this isn't just about getting schools off the list. It really is about creating high performing schools uh, for the neediest children. And so you see some of our goals that are listed here. A question that I oftentimes receive is how do our services coincide with those at the MDE? And here are a list of services and supports that are provided uh, from the, the office or supported by the Office of Field Services, which is largely responsible for the Title I eligible schools, and OEII, the Office of Education Improvement and Innovation. And so there are a series of intervention uh, specialists that support priority schools. Mm -hmm. Um, there are learning supports as well, including technical assistance in professional learning, as well as participation in the superintendent's dropout challenge. Those are the type of services, just to name a few, that are provided uh, to priority schools under the auspices of the MDE. For schools that um, remain in the bottom 5%, the priority schools, um, we have transitioned our focus in the SRO to streamline superintendent communication and involve them to establish expectations, transparency, consistency, and clarity. You would be surprised at how many superintendents, because they had delegated so much of the work, um, were not all together always informed about what, the, what, were going on and what was going on. And there are some superintendents that are far more involved in their priority school process and the turnaround process than others. I will admit that. One of the other supports that the SRO provides includes access to training relative to standards in a cohesive and easily accessible format to target and customize the individual unique needs of each priority school. The other thing folks don't always realize is that not all priority schools are created equal. There are some priority schools that do very well, um, but they carry the status for four years regardless of how well they do. Number three, we also provide customized turnaround interventions based on need, data, and superintendent's requests. Recently, I was having a conversation with Superintendent Sue Carnell um, at, in Westwood Community, and uh, she has a different need than other schools. She wants the SRO to support in the area of differentiating instruction as opposed to some other areas. That's unique to what she feels her teachers need from, from our services. And so we are, in addition to what we've already provided, we'll be going back to Robichaud High to support her in that area. Number four, we also provide what we call real-time school-wide student level data every six to eight weeks. And so that's hugely important because by the time a kid sits for an exam, they know what they know, it's, it's already too late at that point. What we know from high-performing, high-poverty schools is that they are looking at data every six to eight weeks. They understand which kids are in tier one, tier two, tier three, every few weeks. 
They're not waiting till a student sits for an exam to get that information. And what that allows for is what we call mid-course corrections in time prior to a child sitting for an, a high stakes examination and or being in a position to transition out of high school. Number five, we also take a close look at the response to intervention systems. A lot of folks are always surprised that those systems are not altogether formalized in high priority, in, in priority schools. Sometimes people say they have intervention systems and then when you say what percentage of your kids are in tier two, they can't tell you. Um, that's problematic because if you're not clear on which kids have transitioned into tier two, then how can you target uh, the core instructional needs that they have. The second guiding question is what are the academic trends for priority schools? We know that the highest uh, concentration of priority schools is in Wayne County. We also know that over the past five years, 331 schools have been identified statewide as prior having priority status or being in the bottom 5%. 73 schools have been closed by district decision, 74 have been released, and we currently have 184 schools um, that carry the priority school status. Um, and the data points are listed below. I say this frequently, there are only five cohorts of priority schools statewide. Wayne County, again, has the highest concentration of priority schools. In the uh, past five years, over 300 unique schools have been identified, and priority school status, and this is really important for folks, does not necessarily mean that the school's top to bottom ranking is still below 5% because priority schools carry the status regardless of how well they do in that time period. Here are some uh, quick uh, trend slides. This is third grade reading. The blue line is the state. The reddish purple line, <laughs> purple I think, is the, uh, includes all priority schools and this is prior to the release. This data was pulled last summer. This is uh, again third grade reading. Uh, let's see, so we had, I'll stop confusing now, you'll have, you have third grade reading or third grade math first. You see the gap there. Then you see third grade reading. There's still that gap. Eighth grade math. Bottom line is priority schools. Top line is uh, all the state. I'm on slide 13. Eighth grade reading, there's an upswing, but the gap still remains. Slide 15, what's unique is that everybody graduates. Right? So the majority of kids graduate, but we know that there's an academic gap there. Slide 16 is an outlier. Out of all the 331 schools that have been identified, whether they closed or not, we know that two Hazel Park High School and Weberville High School have actually reached that top 25%, right? So um, Hazel Park was identified in 2012 with a top to bottom ranking in five. They had a top to bottom ranking in 2013 of 48, and they were released based on their 2014 top to bottom ranking in the other two exit criteria because they had reached uh, a top to bottom ranking of 85. So what this proves is that it isn't easy to turn your school around. It certainly isn't easy to pull, turn around a high school but it is in fact possible in the state of Michigan. The third guiding question has to do with the SRO, how we collaborate with stakeholders, including superintendents, state agencies, and ISDs, and measure progress in priority schools in time for mid-course corrections. You heard a little bit about um, how we look at data every six to eight weeks. Here are some things that we do in addition to that. We're currently creating what's known as a feeder pattern project, and we're working in collaboration with Washington ISD to do that work as well as MSU and our own data team. It's important to know before sanctions are, are placed on schools, which schools in Michigan actually feed the chronically low performing schools in the state over time? Which schools do that? What are the key variables that are involved? How should this information inform communities and our own decision making process? And then you can see a great example of this work uh, if you take a look at Pinellas County, uh, Florida, the trend study that they've done in, Tampa, in the Tampa Bay Times. We're also measuring progress, again, as I mentioned earlier, towards standards mastery, which standards are being taught and how well are kids doing. That's important because a lot of times, particularly in low-performing schools, kids are being tested on material they, that was never taught, right? And so once you teach material, we also need to know how well the kids do, who didn't master what, and whenever you know who didn't master the material, you can reteach it or you can transition them to new material. 
But if you're not tracking that and no one in the school knows that, it's really a crapshoot when they sit for the exam. <coughs> Number three, we, we are increasing shared accountability for all stakeholders and providing a next level of accountability for chronic low performers. What that means is we involve superintendents. Superintendents are the leaders of the organization. Um, they have all access to everything that goes on in the priority schools, and we see more success and more um, opportunities where superintendents are actually engaged in this process. Number four, we're also including quantitative and qualitative data in our, in our decision making. So it's important to know which schools are not just priority schools, but which priority schools have consecutive years of low proficiency. There are high schools that have not one kid proficient, and not all of those schools are in Detroit, believe it or not. We also look at quantitative data to understand who's been in the bottom 5% for consecutive years. And then obviously those qualitative data components are hugely important because in schools with emergency managers or districts with emergency managers are outside of the purview of the SRO, which means we do not have um, legal right to engage in those particular schools by state statute. So that's an important data point. And there are also considerations around who has formalized intervention systems um, that measure actually intervention, how well is that working in terms of our decision tree when we're looking at next levels of accountability. The last question is just about what necessitates the SRO intervention and why is it necessary? So what are some of the identification factors and why is it necessary? So I always go back to the accountability process for the SRO. It's important to know that all priority schools actually submit a reform redesign plan. Even the emergency manager district or schools, they also submit plans, not because they have to necessarily, but because they want, they too want to be in compliant and turn around their schools. So all priority schools submit redi redesign plans. The SRO, under my leadership now, instead of just looking at compliance components, we actually facilitate superintendent-led turnaround and we monitor student achievement performance outcomes every six to eight weeks. So every six to eight weeks, um, rightfully or wrongfully so, we know how many kids have, have been suspended in priority schools. And that data point can be, um, the quality of that data point is contingent upon what's submitted. Um, but we know that it's high, higher than other schools. Um, if priority schools meet all academic exit criteria, and here are the three exit criteria on the left, that includes percentile rank of 5% of or higher, annual measurable objectives for both math and reading, meeting those annual measurable objectives for math or reading, and testing 95% of their students, then those schools will be released from priority status and return back uh, to the school improvement plan uh, to, to carry on as a non-priority school would in the state of Michigan. If priority schools do not meet academic exit criteria when they become eligible for release, the SRO transition or has the authority to transition the school to the next level of accountability, and that includes a CEO option, placement into the reform district, or closure. I want to point out the fact that closure is an absolute last resort, and it is circumstantial, right? So you have to, we have to have somewhere of higher standing or higher performing schools for those kids to go before we issue a closure. And that's hugely important. So you see closure includes a last resort and circumstantial contingencies apply. This last slide is about college readiness because it speaks to the rationale. By the time a kid graduates from school in Michigan, they ought to have the skill set to go on and do whatever they want in life. And so whether or not that's college or some sort of technical uh, career, it's totally their call, but it's our job to make sure that they have the skill sets to do that. One measure in our country to determine that includes college readiness. And as you can see, over a five-year period, the gap remains between the state and priority high schools. Okay, questions. John, please. Thank you very much for coming, and thank you. Sorry, you had to wait, but thank you for sharing um, your report. We've been looking for this. Um, I guess, as you know, we were not, we didn't feel it was going to be as effective or constructive to remove the turnaround office from the department uh, when it happened, that it would be more effective. We could focus on uh, effective turnaround dramatically working together. 
given to the executive order stated uh, nothing in that order would be to compromise the policy and leadership of the State Board of Education. We very quickly, with Brian's help, uh, gave, offered you uh, a, our recommendations on what school turnaround policy uh, to be effective needs to look like. And we lifted heavily from friends in Massachusetts and their turnaround strategy, which I quote is, is and I quote our policy, is focused on really providing assistance and to help local districts succeed at turning around their own schools. As you know, Massachusetts brings resources, support, uh, research base to improve teaching and learning to the folks in the schools. Uh, and only in the most extreme cases uh, do they then uh, joint operate with a district uh, a turnaround program. Only in the most extreme cases. And so I guess our, our policy guidance on school turnaround includes multiple steps over many years. Uh, do we do an audit and assess the needs? Is a plan made with the school community and its leadership to turn around the school, our support and resources brought to that school uh, are then uh, progress assessed over time. <laughs> and only if uh, that fails to um, contribute to better learning outcomes is one of the more um, dramatic CEO or other options um, made available. That's our recommendation to you. So the particular question is you've moved to a CEO model in East Detroit and have asked for resources to open up CEO models around the state. Um, what set of processes did you go through with those schools over some years to audit, assess, support the operation of a plan, uh, and assess the impact of their plans before turning to a CEO model? Sure. So I, I feel like that's a multi-part question. Um, to your first point, I'll just um, um, make it a point to say that it, it, I think that the guidance that was shared, quite honestly, from the board came a little too late. Had those turnaround, had that turnaround guidance been shared prior to the executive order, maybe things had would have been different from the executive office's perspective. So I do want to put that on the table. The latter part of your question deals with what were the criteria that were used to be assessed. I do want to point out to the board that the schools that have consecutive years of poor performance um, have not a had a high percentage of kids proficient in math or ELA. They have had top to bottom rankings below 5%. Um, and we looked at percent proficient in reading and math over time, right? And so there are a list of schools that have been chronic, what we call chronic low performers. I can tell you right now that some of the lowest performing high schools in the state have less than 10 kids proficient in math. I can tell you right now that some of the, high, the lowest performing high schools in the state of Michigan right now our graduating kids were not one kid in the last five years um, has done well in both math and reading. What that means is that we have schools in the state of Michigan that are graduating 85% of their, their graduating class, but less than 25% of those kids are proficient in core content areas needed to be successful in careers and college and life. And so we looked at a variety of factors, some of which, to your point, to just be clear, included the number of times they were identified, the current ranking over time, percent proficient in reading, percent proficient in math. And so those were some of the criteria that we looked at when we opted to transition schools to a next level of accountability. In addition to that, we looked at if it were a high school, we said, okay, is it just a standalone high school that's having these troubles, or are there feeder patterns that are playing into why these high schools have been low performing over a five-year period? And so I'm not just speaking to schools that are identified in the bottom 5%. I'm referring to schools that have held on to a consecutive zero for three consecutive years, or schools that have been below 5% for consecutive years. Um, and I think it's important to point out what happens to society when we continuously graduate children, particularly the neediest students in the state, who have struggled uh, tremendously in reading and math. Um, and so those are just some of the criteria, or those are the criteria that we looked at to identify who needed a next level of accountability and what was the right uh, system for that. Just a quick follow-up. Yes, so sir. I think we're all... Uh, most concerned with what's going to be most effective in helping those kids get an education and whether a um, supportive 
uh, working with and helping improve their learning environment with the folks there would be more effective than a takeover model. Mm -hmm. But did you suggest that you uh, <coughs> have not been following or ignoring the policy direction from the State Board of Education? I did not suggest that. <laughs> hey, Cassandra? Um, thank you for, for coming today um, and answering our questions. Uh, I want to follow up on, on John's question about the CEO model. I understand that your office has made a request to the legislature for a million dollar supplemental for this fiscal year and then I believe five million dollars for the next fiscal year to hire more CEOs. Um, so I want to talk <coughs> about the role of the CEO for a moment. I reviewed uh, current legislation, 380-1280C, and correct me if I'm wrong, but basically a CEO has a lot of authority. Um, they have both financial and academic authority over multiple schools, including employment, um, control of funds attributable to pupils at the school without consent of the local board of education, can permanently close a school without the consent of the local board of education, can sell that school, closed school without the consent of the local board of education, <coughs> can convert a school into a public school academy without the consent of the local board of education and essentially has the power of the local board of education and administration for that school. Is that your understanding of, of the role that CEOs are given I'd in like legislature? I'd like to respond to that question with everyone having a copy of the state statute. If you look at page two, you can look over the language uh, to which Cassandra is speaking. It is on page two and it is uh, number seven. <coughs> Thank you very much. Just wanted to put that out. If you take a look at page two, at uh, about three quarters of the way down, it's uh, number seven there. It speaks to the CEO model. We do plan on following, following the full letter of the law. However, uh, under my leadership, it is uh, my intent to ensure that we hire an academic expert who behaves and makes the types of decisions that are in the best interest of the children. I can tell you that I speak to both Macomb uh, quite often in the last few months and have met with them regularly. I also just got off the phone yesterday with Dr. Ryan McLeod, who I connect with quite regularly. Um, we have a, I have a very solid relationship with Ryan, and he trusts me, I trust him, and in education that's important because in order to create a high-performing <coughs> school, it is important that we uh, do what's in the best in interest of children. And so we are hiring uh, a CEO. You are absolutely correct, mm -hmm. but make no mistake that we will collaborate with the district and the school board. And the school board's president is Craig, Ryan is the superintendent, and I'm in very uh, close contact with Ryan on a regular basis to make sure this is a collaborative effort. So although these stipulations are stated here, um, and it is within the full letter of the law for a CEO to do that, our intention is to work collaboratively with the district as we have demonstrated since the summertime. So my question uh, actually had more to do with um, the input of the citizens uh, involved in this process. Yeah. If this person has the right to essentially assume the role of the Board of Education, what is the role of the citizen, the taxpayers who are actually paying for these buildings? Are there public hearings? Do they have any input? Or are they just kind of blindsided with a news release saying, oh, by the way, we're putting a, a CEO in your school? Dr. McLeod and I, again, work very closely together. At the end of every conversation, I asked, how are your teachers doing? How are your kids doing? And yesterday, he said, Natasha, we're doing well. They're motivated. I've had a conversation <laughs> with them. I've shared the documentation that you've shared with me. And so he is in a position right now to maintain absolute transparency with the community uh, once we sit down with the board and have a, a certain dialogue the next step from there is for Ryan and I to connect and make sure we get in front of the teachers so that they can see what the SRO does what it doesn't do and from there after we have the adults in the educational setting on one accord it's then appropriate for us to go in solidarity to the community but I want to assure you that those dialogues are happening and that we are doing this in a phased in process. It's important for the board to be actively engaged as they are in Massachusetts. It's important for uh, me to stay in close communication with Ryan as I do. Um, and so the communication with the community to which you speak is in the process of being 
uh, organized. However, there are steps that need to ta be ta that take that are taking place prior to that day. So that communication happens after decisions have been made, not before. Which communications? With the people who are most affected by this, with the, the parents, with the taxpayers, with the citizens. Ryan McLeod, Dr. McLeod has been in communication with his parents um, prior to, during, and after. He's a strong um, new superintendent to that area. We have a good relationship, so I think I would be remiss to uh, communicate that he hasn't done that. He's done very well being transparent with the community. But you, your office doesn't take a role in that at all? We will eventually, but right now I don't want to undercut Ryan. I've told him that I would never do that to him, and he knows that I wouldn't. So we've had multiple conversations about how to communicate and to whom, and it's worked well so far. Okay. So just to, to kind of follow up on the, the items that are in the law here, it's, it seems to me that a CEO actually has more authority than an emergency manager because they also have oversight over academics. So I, I have two kind of concerns about that. Uh, well, actually, one I just mentioned, which is the role of the citizens. But the other, um, it, the, it, I, I'm wondering if we can acknowledge the fact that emergency management hasn't worked. Um, I can point to numerous examples where uh, the state has come in, taken over, and left it in worse condition than when it started, which I think is the major concern with everybody that I talk to about the CEO model. It's that um, it's not based on something we've done that's been successful yet. And um, so I guess my question would be, why would we think that this, which is essentially an emergency manager on steroids, would be more uh, effective than what we've already done, which has proven not to be effective. Whenever someone kind of makes the connection with the emergency manager, I try to take them out of that box and kind of ask them to release the parameters. Right now, the highest performing state in the nation is Massachusetts. They do a model that is uh, similar to what we've created here. They put schools into receivership, um, and they do their due diligence to do that. I didn't read about Massachusetts and decide to create a model. I actually uh, took my entire team after I reconstituted the office and provided uh, the state with folks in the reform office who have done the work at a leadership level in the classroom, um, in the social, uh, social cycle world. Um, I think it's important to note that we actually took our entire team to visit my counterpart, jo T Joan Tuttle, in Massachusetts. We sat with her entire team for four days. Some of the work was at the department, some of it was in schools. And we learned explicitly the process that they go through for their high-performing high and high-poverty schools, um, as well as their low-performing high-poverty schools. And so the model that we brought back to Michigan wasn't just designed in isolation as a Michigander. We took what we have and we understood what the highest performing state does, and we created this model. So I would um, ask folks to just be a little bit more open-minded um, and just to realize that it's not modeled after the EM. What we've designed in the SRO under my leadership is designed after the model in Massachusetts. Right, and I, I, I appreciate that, and I think there are some very big differences between Massachusetts and Michigan, but I'll just make one last point, and then I will um, let open the floor. But it, Massachusetts is operating under Massachusetts law. Michigan is operating under Michigan law. And under Michigan law, these things are possible. And I think that we have seen time and time again where the stuff in this law is imposed on our local school districts, and it doesn't work. And I think that's the concern. I'm just going to reiterate it again. It's great that it's based on a model in Massachusetts, but it's following Michigan law. And that's where I think your issue is going to come into play with trust and everything else in the state. I think that policy and practice are hugely important. It's one of the things that we see aligned in Massachusetts. And I think it's also important to recognize that execution is about the skill set of the people who are doing the work. And if you've got people who can be trusted, who have the skill to um, boost instructional quality, who have the leadership ability to garner support and motivate and not undercut or lie, this work can be done well in Michigan. So, thank you, Eileen. Thank you. Uh, it's uh, really, uh, really wonderful to hear this. To underscore what you were talking about, how, uh, that 85% of our kids are graduating even though they're not competent to do so, not competent for real life. I spent Monday uh, with uh, Representative Santana and a number of legislators at Henry Ford High School. 
Uh, and uh, the presentations that we had from uh, former gang members, former convicts, former undercover uh, drug agent, uh, prison warden, uh, social workers, principals from both uh, 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 charter schools and traditional schools. One of the biggest things that came out was that the former gang member members beg begged for no more social promotion. Mm. Uh, these were young men who'd served time in prison already, were in their early 30s, and had come back to the community with the ex-convicts to try to provide the support for what they call the daddy issue, that mm -hmm. there are no men in the community, or very few, uh, who, uh, because people are in prison or they've died. And uh, they said that there is nothing worse than walking into ninth grade and mm -hmm. discovering that there are kids who can read and write at grade level, but they can't. Mm -hmm. Recognizing that the culture of the school doesn't provide remediation for them at that point. Most mm -hmm. schools don't. You, you remediate K-8 and then you try to prevail and go forward in 9-12. Mm -hmm. And that there is no chance for them. So they stay in school, as they said, to either deal drugs or to pass the time if they can uh, function and be nice. And because they'll end up graduating, that 85% number, or going out in the streets because you can make more money selling drugs in the long term on the streets when you go early. Mm -hmm. So um, I commend you for the kinds of things, the deep work that you're doing to make a difference in these schools. And uh, having visited Michigan State recently, um, sitting with Barbara Markle and mm -hmm. looking at their, um, their, the level of, of data that they're crunching and, uh, and trying to convert to usable uh, information, the, I would pass on their um, I wouldn't say plea, but I would say uh, nudging that as you go through finding out what data really does make a difference for children, that you do what the rest of the state has been doing recently, which is to look at reports and figure out whether the uh, data gathering is essential for uh, the progress that you need to measure. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, I'm, I'm no, campaigning absolutely. on their behalf. So, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Michelle, please. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I was looking through your the website <coughs> yes, I know, how to get a feeling, and um, I came across this paragraph. It says um, on June 12, 2015. It's a short paragraph. Executive Order 2015-9 transfer the SRO from the Michigan Department of Ed to the Department of Technology Management and Budget. We see this as an opportunity to learn from experience and take actions necessary to drive rapid turnaround statewide. To meet this challenge and opportunity, the SRO has developed a multifaceted approach supporting priority <coughs> schools um, and districts that builds upon research and best practices, addresses obstacles that have hindered previous turnaround efforts, and identifies contingencies and strategies for mitigating potential obstacles that might derail our efforts. So my question is, what are the obstacles that have previously hindered turnaround efforts? And what do you see as the, uh, uh, the contingencies and strategies for mitigating these potential obstacles that might derail the efforts now? Uh, that's a large question. Um, I think uh, just to narrow it a bit, um, the SRO uh, received a lot of resistance in the MDE, quite honestly. There are different schools of thought. Um, there are folks who feel like they should go into meetings and talk reform and turn around without the superintendent's involvement. Um, <coughs> there, are super, there are folks who felt like without the leader or the head of the organization, the work is really difficult um, because you need someone in a leadership position to reinforce what's important for kids. Um, you need a way to streamline information. Um, and so I believe that there were just different schools of thought between the SRO, which is more of a triage, emergency room type of uh, experience, whereas school improvement is more gradual um, and it should be continuous, right? Um, but over time, if that school improvement doesn't work in four years, there ought to be another course of action. Um, because again, we aren't dealing with widgets, we're dealing with human lives here. Um, and so uh, to that point, uh, when we write and when we say that there um, are challenges, organizationally it was difficult to have innovative ideas and to release schools. I wasn't even allowed to release schools until I transitioned, but I had been working in the organization in MDE in this role trying to release schools, trying to let folks know that if we let schools go, because of the stigma that it carries, it provides an incentive that's needed in the field. Even that decision was not allowed. Um, so there were a number of uh, challenges that we faced, and that's just an example of one. Um, now, if you ask a superintendent what are some of the challenges, they might speak to uh, 
you know, having to set aside certain amounts of their federal state dollars, their Title I dollars, <laughs> not having the flexibility they want to do what they need on the ground. So it really is contingent upon who you ask about the challenges. Those are just two. Um, yeah. so I guess people, could I ask a follow-up sure. another question? Well, this is a related question, but one that <coughs> always uh, I see as a fatal flaw to the whole reform movement mm -hmm. is the reliance on these tests mm -hmm. that the American, American Statistical Association <coughs> are an invalid measure. Mm -hmm. And so we rely on measuring what who is proficient or who isn't proficient, um, or what schools should be open, what schools should be closed, what teachers should be hired, what teachers should be fired. But we, we rely too heavily on these standardized tests. And, uh, for, in, and for instance, um, you know, I pulled up some data that talked about special education. And so in Detroit, of all of Wayne County, there are, I had it written down, oh, here it is. So um, the head of the special ed department pulled for me the FTEs for um, you know the services, the service hours that are provided to uh, mildly, <coughs> to moderately cognitively impaired, severely cognitively impaired, and multiply cognitively impaired, or multiply yeah impaired, severely impaired. For all of the charter schools in the entire of Wayne County, the answer is zero for the 14-15 year from which I had the data. Though that, the bulk of that work is put on traditional public schools. And in Detroit, they have almost 20% of the, or it's closer to 20, no, it's 16.74. Let me exaggerate. Was special ed students, but of those, an even larger degree were the <coughs> most severely disabled. The, the charters aren't taking them, and the EAA is not servicing them. I mean, so. It's been estimated that it leads to like 40 million out of the DPS budget every year of the general funds to subsidize what's needed. So I say all this to say I give that as an example of some of the complicating underlying factors that don't always get in, uh, identified in when we're looking at um, academic or fiscal uh, quote unquote failures. Mm -hmm. um, not to mention, and I've heard that you look at you do look at absentee rates, mm -hmm. which I think is awesome. I really applaud that because I think that has a huge effect on uh, on that. But so my question is, I understand that your office was going to be comp compiling the top to bottom from now. That's part of your role is to compile the top to bottom list. Is that correct? We work in collaboration. Yeah, that's with a the joint ADD. thing. That is that's in a joint. 12 ADC. Okay, and given that there's going to be the ESSA, it's going to allow for some more flexibility on things. And given the people's, the, the communities, a lot of folks complaining and Obama admitting that, it, that that was a failure with all this testing. So what, what, is, what are your plans to more effectively assess schools that are considered um, successful or not without the over reliance on standardized tests and taking in all of the mitigating circumstances like special education and poverty. So that's sure. a big old question, I'm sorry, but um, I had to fit like four in one. I well, so let me just say, I think we're gonna work very collaboratively to develop a process that this board will be very involved in, the governor's office will be very involved in, the legislature, the field. I mean, we really have an opportunity to envision a different future. And I'm excited about being able to envision that different future, all of us sitting together, including Natasha, having a prime seat at the table. And, and it will be a very inclusive process, and I think a very exciting process, because I think we have much more flexibility than we had in the past. And I think we can design a future that does help every student be successful, and that's we'll work together to make that happen. Will we, will we be getting rid of these uh, intervention models to, where they fire the principal well, I, and do all this stuff too? Because that's uh, an opportunity to get rid of these things. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we want to make sure that um, we do maintain some continuity. So it's going to be important that if something is working on the ground level mm -hmm. and that they're planned, they can get behind it, the teachers are supportive, that that doesn't change for the sake of change. If something isn't working, we ought to be flexible enough to say, it's not working, let's move forward. And so I just want to provide that leverage Does there that for the like firing all the teachers and the principal? I mean, that doesn't sound like very If they're not working, she said. Teachers are working. <laughs> and we have yeah, four yeah, models we have they can use. We'll bring it up that okay. legislative yeah, committee. But I think you're right. Those are important yeah. questions. Those are, yep. Michelle, I think those are important questions as we move forward. Okay. Anything else? Or are we ready to move on? Yeah. Kathleen? Yeah, Kathleen and Pam? Thanks, Natasha. 
it's a it's very informative for us. So I had a question on this this uh, how you exit from this. It talks about if it meets all of your academic all these exit criteria, percent or rank of five percent or higher. We we had said we're not going to measure that for the next couple of years because of the change in the test. So what list? What list are you using for the five for the lowest five percent now? How do they get off? How do they get off of that above the five percent if they uh, we're not changing the five percent list? The, yep. the uh, top to bottom list. So two responses to that question. The first is that we have posted on our site uh, the schools that are in the bottom five percent currently, um, and that data is. Uh, that the data that we used for that list uh, was the last available data so that's from 2014 right so 1415 was the first time the assessment was given and so this the list that we had right. prior to that first time that this the assessment was uh, administered still stands and so schools that were released are based on that 2013 2014 <coughs> uh, data oh. okay and oh. so we're going to work in collaboration with the MDE uh, to Brian's point around identification of the bottom 5% yeah. given the data that we'll, uh, uh, that we'll have here pretty soon. Okay. I had another question. I, uh, I understand you said that if the, if the school district is under emergency manager, you don't have anything to do with it. Under so, state statute, yeah. emergency so, management. So Detroit, you don't deal with the DPS schools. The DPS schools, as long as they're under emergency right. management, they do not fall under okay. the purview of what the SRO. What about the EAA schools? Do you deal, do you handle those? They, because they have schools that are in the bottom 5%. They do, and they have submitted reform redesign plans, um, and I do connect with Veronica Conforman quite often. Oh, you do? Mm -hmm. So are any of those schools, that you, are you working, is the SRO working in those, any of those schools now? I connect with Veronica quite often, mm -hmm. um, but she does have a lever. Uh, uh, she does have the latitude to try some innovative things in the, in those particular buildings. Um, I'm not really at liberty to go into much more detail than that around DPS and, and EAA, as they are sensitive topics um, with everything that's going on in the state right now. Okay, because I I understood uh, the information I heard was about the East Detroit schools that they had been working very closely with the Macomb Intermediate School District and they were surprised that, that you went in there. They thought they were working with IS, the ISD and would not be part of the SRO. So I don't know, I'm curious as to how that proceeded, how come you did that? Sure, so um, what I don't know that folks are aware of um, is the fact that we have been in constant communication with Macomb ISD. In fact, we have a priority school contract with them to do the work. Uh, the ISD has been heavily engaged in all of their priority schools. East Detroit uh, had maintained its current uh, ranking of zero and have fluctuated between zero and three over time. Not only that, but they also now have Bellevue Elementary, Kelly Middle, and Pleasantville uh, Elementary that are all that all have top to bottom rankings of one and so sometimes the supports are very helpful and, and engaging and it's a very robust ISD and and sometimes there uh, are some you know circumstances that warrant further intervention and this is one of those what we see in East Detroit is a feeder pattern we see that a high school is struggling to get out of the bottom five percent um, but that their feeder pattern has also um, been transitioning students into the high school of a quality that um, of, a, of an academic quality that that is lacking and so it's really important that we look at the entire system and not just the high school it's very difficult to turn around a low performing high school you have to understand what's happening at lower levels and the ISD has been actively engaged for quite some time um, and we have been uh, attempting to continue to collaborate with the ISD as well. well I'm glad to hear that that's thank you all right, Pam, I'm in Cassandra. Okay, just a couple of points. Um, Michelle <coughs> raised the um, thought of mitigating factors. Um, and Michelle also, we were talking, reminded me of a study in Detroit that looked at 40, 000, the lead levels of, of around 40,000 children where only 23, per, 23 in count um, did not have a lead level, um, did not have lead in their bloodstream. I mean, I, the issue that we're seeing in Flint, obviously, again, we're making this greater connection between these other factors that play into academic performances. This study also looked at 
uh, the outcomes of, of uh, academic performance as it related to uh, the MEET score. So this was a 2010 study, but I'm just wondering if we're also taking those uh, factors uh, into consideration as we make these uh, very uh, rigid decisions that we're making. Um, one of the other things, um, Kathy brought up the thought of DPS and how this will play into the DPS situation, and you did say that you can't really speak to this, but if an emergency manager is removed, then the CEO model, um, as Cassandra pointed out, which is an EM on steroids, could possibly play a greater, uh, I mean, that could supplant that. Um, then a few other questions that I have are related to um, some of the information that I've received um, while talking to some of the educators throughout the state as far as the process um, that was used last year. Um, looking at um, what is, there were, there were many who said that they weren't clear of what the cycle, you know, what the cycle is, um, what they can look forward to next year. Um, as it related to this year, um, many talked about how it seemed as if it was uh, a car that was being built as, as it was moving down the road. So they weren't, some of the assessments, the testing, I think Michelle talked about testing, and it was more testing that was placed on top of testing um, that was already uh, going on, so there wasn't time to really think through what was already in place, and then the additional testing that, that was required. Um, just, I guess, greater communication around, you know, what is the focus for next year? And also, um, I guess my question is, I hear Brian talking about moving forward, how the communication will work between the department and the um, SRO, um, the, the office, uh, DTMB, but how is that, how did that work? How is that working now, and how has that worked up to this point? Um, and then uh, I think that that even that trickles down to how districts are communicated to, and so that plays a role into the confusion at the district level if, if that communication is not happening here. Mm -hmm. So um, those are, I think, some of, the, I think that that would be it. Yep. I'm going to start with the um, concern about clarity. Um, I communicate and streamline all information to superintendents. There are some superintendents that are very actively engaged with their executive teams and their staff, and so as soon as I send an email, as soon as I make a call, as soon as a text message goes out, their entire organization knows about it, right? Um, and there are some superintendents where that doesn't quite happen. Didn't get the email, didn't remember to call, didn't do this, didn't do that. And then there are all those folks in between. The purpose of streamlining communication directly to superintendents is so that there is a, a, a clear and active way to be transparent. Um, and so there are always going to be those outliers of folks who didn't get information and we'll do the best that we can to mitigate that. But I do want to be clear that um, every superintendent has my cell phone number. I text quite often. They've gotten emails from me at all hours of the day and night on weekends and weeknights. Um, so that is how we communicate because prior to transitioning over, there were a lot of different emails and calls flying where people were confused. So I want to just be clear about how we communicate with the local districts that have priority schools. Um, as far as the CEO option in Detroit, that's not a discussion that we're having right now. Um, we are in the process of supporting the efforts on the ground. Um, and we will definitely be in dialogue with the community when that takes place. I live on the east side of Detroit. Detroit is very near and dear to my heart, and I grew up like the kids in Detroit. Um, and so we're going to make sure that we are actively engaged in that process when the time comes. Um, however, the time has not come yet. Uh, in terms of your concern about testing and time, uh, the testing decisions come out of the MDE, and so that's probably a dialogue um, for uh, Superintendent Whiston. So this was additional information that I understand was required. Paris in the six to eight Paris, yeah. month. Yeah. Okay, so Paris is a, is a it stands for Performance Information System. Um, and what that does is that allows us every six to eight weeks to see how many kids have been suspended, how many kids are truant, um, and which kids have transitioned from tier two to tier three. It's important for us to be able to dialogue with superintendent about that information um, because if children are being uh, overly over suspended or if they have a dis, you know a, a suspension rate for certain kids than others right 
um, that needs to be flagged prior to assessment and prior to high stakes decision. You cannot flag those kind of challenges if you don't know that it happens until six months later. You have to know when it's happening in order to provide a mid-course correction. And so, and so that's the purpose of collecting that information and dialoguing about it. Right, so, and I know you've probably heard this from multiple districts, because this was multiple districts that brought this up. It was the timing of when this information was requested, and it sounded like it was going into the classrooms, and there were educators who already had additional uh, testing uh, in addition to the testing that's done here. And so that added an additional burden and it was, uh, and it came down at a time when there was no time for there to be integration of these, uh, of the data collection. Yeah, and at the end of this year, we're gonna do what's called an end of year uh, uh, sort of feedback session where I get a chance to sit with different superintendents in different parts of the state to hear what worked and what didn't work well. And so we'll dialogue about that and make the changes that are necessary to make sure that it, it is helpful. Um, the other component about how it's working in terms of MDE and SRO, I, com I connect quite frequently uh, with <coughs> Norma Jean Sass and Brian. I work very closely with Karen McPhee and obviously all of the leadership uh, at the DTMB. Um, so I think it's going well. If Norma Jean has a question for me, she calls or texts and likewise. So she and I have a regular time that we check in and it's not anything formal most of the time. Most of the time it's like, here's my priorities, here's the questions, I need this, I need that. And that's how we've engaged. She's a, a wonderful leader. I really like working with her um, and I think it's going well, quite honestly. Um, and with that said, the last component is obviously the poverty factor. And I always say to people when they say consider poverty, I say, thank God my teachers didn't. Thank God my teachers didn't. I think because my, I, uh, just to, to your point, is that I wanted to be held to the same standard I grew up in California as the kids in Orange County. Because I wanted to be able to go into a college classroom and know that I could read as well as those kids. And I was the black girl who grew up in a single parent household and I was the black girl who grew up where my brother was shot and murdered when I was 12. And my brother, my other brother did smoke crack cocaine in my, in my bathroom. But thank God my teacher still said, make sure you study for that physics exam. Because I wouldn't have the opportunity to work with the governor's office had I not had the skill set to do so. And so I, I understand full well how people want to take poverty into account, but thank God my teachers didn't. <laughs> my question wasn't poverty. It was about the childhood lead poisoning um, and those. I'm those not an ex, a medical expert in that area, and so um, what I heard from you was about the poverty component and taking that into consideration when making high stakes decisions. That, that was, was her. No, I, I said she <laughs> reminded me, yeah. and and that's a concern of mine is that we yeah. may not have the skill set yeah. to do that, yeah. and so we're already seeing how this is playing out in one area, and so I'm concerned about us making these high stake decisions and we're not concerned about these other factors uh, that, that we know about. And I think we would clearly. be remiss to just kind of say we're not concerned. That's not what we're saying. What we're saying is that- You just said you weren't the expert in the- I'm not, I'm not a medical expert. Considered. Okay. Pam, I'm not. Okay. But I do know that when kids come with challenges, if there's a system set up to address those challenges without excuse, they can make it. All right, Cassandra, please. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> I wanted to follow up on Kathleen's questions because um, I'm still trying to understand the decision-making process around the CEOs, and I think if, if we understand it, then I think the other schools um, that you're working with might have a better understanding as well. Um, you mentioned uh, East Detroit High School, which I did review the 2010, 2011, and 2012 cohort lists that are on your website, and I do see East Detroit High School um, on the 2011 cohort <coughs> list. But I didn't see Bellevue, I didn't see Pleasant View, and I didn't see Kelly, which tells me that they came on the list after the last cohort list that you have on your website. In the time that they would have come on that list, East Detroit <coughs> High School also eliminated an $8.5 million deficit without any help from the state. <coughs> they implemented reforms. And, and they also have ACT composite scores that are higher than some other high schools in the state. And, and there are 28, states in the, 28 schools in the state that are ranked at a zero, so I'm still trying to understand why East Detroit? Okay. What was it about this school district that you decided was the one that needed a CEO? I want to correct you on just a couple of things. Um, Bellevue Elementary was identified in 2013, mm -hmm. um, and they had a, a top to bottom ranking of
three cohort lists that are on your website? I'll have to double check those lists to make sure that okay. they're accurate and that you and I are looking at the same information. Okay. So I guess my question is, again, of all of the schools that you're working with, of all of the districts, why East Detroit? What was the decision making into that? I mentioned earlier when John asked the question about the, the uh, criteria that went into that, and so you guys have that information. Um, uh, when we look at the number of schools that are the lowest in the entire state, there are certain schools that we do not, that do not fall under our purview. So uh, if a school has an EM, if they are under consent agreement, there are different parameters there. Um, among the lowest performing high schools in the state of Michigan, East Detroit is there. If we would be remiss to just try and turn around a high school when we know that the feeder pattern is demonstrating that the kids feeding the high school are too far behind to turn that high school around, you have to look at the entire system. So, so the rationale to your point right. was what, what is in the full letter of the law? Can we go into certain schools? And in the answer, if the answer is yes, then they're on this side of the house for further consideration. The answer is no, there's nothing I can do to go into certain schools. It just so happened that East Detroit was, A, among the lowest performing high schools in the state. Uh, when we look at uh, the number of cycles that they were identified, the current top to bottom ranking that we have, um, as well as the proficiency levels. And then we have a full understanding of the kids feeding from the lower schools into the high school. And so the determination had been made uh, to uh, have a CEO who had the academic expertise to do that work and be on the ground in collaboration with the district. However, they are not, we're not doing this work in isolation. We are collaborating with the ISD as well as the school district and the superintendent, as I mentioned earlier. And we are positioning ourselves to make sure that there are further determinations that are going to be made uh, you know, in the following years, which we're ramping up. Okay. So it's their ranking and it's the fact that they have four, not just the school. It's their ranking, their proficiency, and all of the schools feeding that system. Okay. Michelle? Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to clarify what I meant by poverty. Um, and I like to use as an example my uh, one of my sons who I ended up adopting when he was 16 years old. Um, we've been in and out of foster care, had, you know, parents who had some serious issues with substance abuse. So when he came to me, he had um, less than a one-point grade point average. Uh, he had no health um, care or to attend to his hearing impairment. So when we took him and got him back into the same school, same Detroit High School, when we got him attended to, and I made sure that he was in class every day, um, he went. Um, he went up. By the time he graduated, he had four pointed his the next semester, um, and brought up his grade point average. So it's the same school, the same teachers, and now yes. he's learning because at home he has structure, and he has. So and so I applaud whatever parent raised you, because they obviously did what it did what was ever necessary, and you who did whatever is necessary, but. There are many kids that are in poverty, and they are smart children. They, are, they have great potential, and I think about all the potential that's wasted. But to say that that poverty does not matter, in his case and in many other cases, is an illusion. I th yeah. Because it does matter. I th yeah. And, and I'm, the studies, yeah. when they look at the top to bottom list, and you look at the relative, and, then, and the, the, uh, um, the Mackinac Center, you can see there is this very very strong correlation with the level of the socioeconomic um, uh, uh, impact. It's not, and it's not that those kids aren't smart. And no one here is saying that those kids are not smart and capable. It's saying that you need to have the supports and the structures to help ensure that you're in school and get the instruction. And it's not, it would have been wrong to blame those teachers, the same teachers, because now he was actually going to school on a regular basis with the, with the health care and support that he needed. Again, there are just some points we're going to have to agree to disagree on. I understand the correlation. What I don't fundamentally support is a, a, a parallel system that lowers the bar for high poverty kids. Okay, so I just want to be clear about that. No. The other thing is I want to be clear about is that there are high poverty schools in Massachusetts, and I would love for this board to go and check out Roxbury Prep 
which is in Dorchester and some other schools. Um, and so there are high performing, high poverty schools in this country who are doing this work. And it's not that they don't understand that the kids are poor or that they've got all of these problems. In spite of those circumstances, they've developed a system that is of equal weight with the kids coming out of Boston Latin so that those kids can make it. All I'm suggesting is, I hear you, please don't create a parallel system for poor kids. No, I don't. We don't. That, we've they never said that. Yeah. Okay. They need more supports, and that's what they're doing in okay. Massachusetts. I mean, we have a lot of high poverty, high ELL students and schools in the state that are performing at a very high level. We don't just need to go to Boston to do it. We are way behind schedule, Kathleen. I just wanted to say that I was concerned about the poverty issue, too. And it seems to me that, we, that it's not just no one's suggesting a parallel system. What we want is to give support and assistance to the families, many of whom might not know how to help their children the way we think they should. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, that's the thing that we have to recognize, that we have to work with the families as well as the children in the schools. Mm -hmm. that, that's the point I wanted to make. Sure. Absolutely. All right. So. Uh, Natasha, thank you for being here. Thank, thank you. you for working with the department. Thank you for communicating with Norma Jean and I. Thank you for sharing with us what, where you are heading and what you are working on. I certainly understand the feeder system concept and needing to work with feeders. If we're going to fix a high school, we need to address and fix uh, uh, the feeder schools as well. So I thank you. Uh, and, and of course, I agree with you that a collaboration model is really, really where we need to head. So I thank you for your work. And it's difficult. And uh, but the department and you and the governor's office, you know, we need to continue to build that good relationship so that schools and students are getting the services they need. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank All you. right. So we are going to bypass the presentation on state uh, uh, on the Every Student Succeeds Act. We'll see if we can catch it this afternoon. If we can't, we'll go on to the next board meeting with that. The next item on the committee, the whole agenda, is discussion regarding criteria for grant programs. Does anyone have questions for staff on the three grant criteria programs uh, that are listed on the agenda? If so, we will get those questions answered before this afternoon. So please let me know if you have any questions now. Does the board wish to go back to any conversations on item B before we adjourn for lunch? Or are we all set on B with the understanding that Eileen is going to give us some additional yep. thoughts on wordage? Does anybody else need or wish to speak on B? Yeah, I just know it, we are offering this begin, good beginning, an excellent set of guidance, I think, that folks want, um, including I would, Chris Wyden, I saw the other day, who's been a strong advocate <laughs> for the superintendent of schools, really want this kind of guidance for how to support LGBTQ kids. But the public now and others should please weigh in. And, and give ideas on how to improve this kind of guidance that uh, is important for us to make to, as for all the reasons we heard, I think, Rick, you were particularly eloquent, 150,000 kids are out there who we need to encourage as best we can an environment that helps them thrive and succeed and be connected to the people teaching them. Uh, and I appreciate your, your um, more eloquent than any of us articulation <coughs> of why this is important and how this works. All right, with that, uh, good afternoon. The time is now 12.30. So much for lunch. And a quorum of the Board of Education is present. So the State Board of Education meeting for March 8, 2016 is called to order. Before we break for lunch, as you know, my evaluation is on the agenda for later in the meeting. <laughs> According to Section A8 of the Open Meeting Act, a public officer can request a closed session in order to consider a period for personal evaluation. Therefore, I will entertain a motion followed by a roll call vote to go into executive session for the purpose of a superintendent evaluation. So moved. Support. It's moved and supported. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, Marilyn will call. Roll. Austin? Yes. Hecto? Yes. Pew? Yes. Ramos Fontini? She's in the Strauss? Yes. Albrich? Yes. Weiser? Yes. Siley? Yes. All right, so we're adjourned from lunch from 1230 to 130. Thank you. <laughs> Cassandra had a hard time getting to it yesterday. We were having all kinds of uh, yeah. difficulties. Yeah.
Good. How are you doing? Yeah. Thank you.